Solomon's son of David took firm control of his kingdom, for the Lord his God was with him and made him very powerful. Solomon called together all the leaders of Israel, the generals and captains of the army, the judges, and all the political and clan leaders. Then he led the entire assembly to the place of worship in Gibeon, for God's tabernacle was located there. This was the tabernacle that Moses, the Lord's servant, had made in the wilderness. David had already moved the Ark of God from Kiriath Jerim to the tent he had prepared for it in Jerusalem. But the bronze altar made by Bezalel son of Uri and grandson of Hur was there at Gibeon in front of the tabernacle of the Lord. So Solomon and the people gathered in front of it to consult the Lord. There in front of the tabernacle, Solomon went up to the bronze altar in the Lord's presence and sacrificed one thousand burnt offerings on it. That night God appeared to Solomon and said, What do you want? Ask, and I will give it to you. Solomon replied to God, You showed great and faithful love to David, my father, and now you have made me king in his place. O Lord God, please continue to keep your promise to David my father, for you have made me king over a people as numerous as the dust of the earth. Give me the wisdom and knowledge to lead them properly, for who could possibly govern this great people of yours? God said to Solomon, Because your greatest desire is to help your people, and you did not ask for wealth, riches, fame, or even the death of your enemies or a long life, but rather you asked for wisdom and knowledge to properly govern my people. I will certainly give you the wisdom and knowledge you requested. But I will also give you wealth, riches, and fame such as no other king has had before you or will ever have in the future. Then Solomon returned to Jerusalem from the tabernacle at the place of worship in Gibeon, and he reigned over Israel. Solomon built up a huge force of chariots and horses. He had 1,400 chariots and 12,000 horses. He stationed some of them in the chariot cities and some near him in Jerusalem. The king made silver and gold as plentiful in Jerusalem as stone. And valuable cedar timber was as common as the sycamore fig trees that grow in the foothills of Judah. Solomon's horses were imported from Egypt and from Cilicia, the king's traders acquired them from Cilicia at the standard price. At that time chariots from Egypt could be purchased for 600 pieces of silver, and horses for 150 pieces of silver. They were then exported to the kings of the Hittites and the kings of Aram. Solomon decided to build a temple to honor the name of the Lord, and also a royal palace for himself. He enlisted a force of 70,000 laborers, 80,000 men to quarry stone in the hill country, and 3,600 foremen. Solomon also sent this message to King Hiram at Tyre, Send me cedar logs as you did for my father, David, when he was building his palace. I am about to build a temple to honor the name of the Lord my God. It will be a place set apart to burn fragrant incense before him, to display the special sacrificial bread, and to sacrifice burnt offerings each morning and evening, on the Sabbaths, at new moon celebrations, and at the other appointed festivals of the Lord our God. He has commanded Israel to do these things forever. This must be a magnificent temple because our God is greater than all other gods. But who can really build him a worthy home? Not even the highest heavens can contain him. So who am I to consider building a temple for him, except as a place to burn sacrifices to him? So send me a master craftsman who can work with gold, silver, bronze, and iron, as well as with purple, scarlet, and blue cloth. He must be a skilled engraver who can work with the craftsmen of Judah and Jerusalem who were selected by my father, David. 
Also send me cedar, cypress, and red sandalwood logs from Lebanon, for I know that your men are without equal at cutting timber in Lebanon. I will send my men to help them. An immense amount of timber will be needed, for the temple I am going to build will be very large and magnificent. In payment for your woodcutters, I will send 100,000 bushels of crushed wheat, 100,000 bushels of barley, 110,000 gallons of wine, and 110,000 gallons of olive oil. King Hiram sent this letter of reply to Solomon, It is because the Lord loves his people that he has made you their king. Praise the Lord, the God of Israel, who made the heavens and the earth. He has given King David a wise son, gifted with skill and understanding, who will build a temple for the Lord and a royal palace for himself. I am sending you a master craftsman named Huram Abi, who is extremely talented. His mother is from the tribe of Dan in Israel, and his father is from Tyre. He is skillful at making things from gold, silver, bronze, and iron, and he also works with stone and wood. He can work with purple, blue, and scarlet cloth and fine linen. He is also an engraver and can follow any design given to him. He will work with your craftsmen and those appointed by my Lord David, your father. Send along the wheat, barley, olive oil, and wine that my Lord has mentioned. We will cut whatever timber you need from the Lebanon mountains and will float the logs and rafts down the coast of the Mediterranean Sea to Joppa. From there you can transport the logs up to Jerusalem. Solomon took a census of all foreigners in the land of Israel, like the census his father had taken, and he counted 153,600. He assigned 70,000 of them as common laborers, 80,000 as quarry workers in the hill country, and 3,600 as foremen. So Solomon began to build the temple of the Lord in Jerusalem on Mount Moriah, where the Lord had appeared to David, his father. The temple was built on the threshing floor of Araunah the Jebusite, the site that David had selected. The construction began in mid-spring, during the fourth year of Solomon's reign. These are the dimensions Solomon used for the foundation of the Temple of God, using the old standard of measurement. It was 90 feet long and 30 feet wide. The entry room at the front of the temple was 30 feet wide, running across the entire width of the temple, and 30 feet high. He overlaid the inside with pure gold. He paneled the main room of the temple with cypress wood, overlaid it with fine gold, and decorated it with carvings of palm trees and chains. He decorated the walls of the temple with beautiful jewels and with gold from the land of Parvain. He overlaid the beams, thresholds, walls, and doors throughout the temple with gold, and he carved figures of cherubim on the walls. He made the most holy place 30 feet wide, corresponding to the width of the temple, and 30 feet deep. He overlaid its interior with 23 tons of fine gold. The gold nails that were used weighed 20 ounces each. He also overlaid the walls of the upper rooms with gold. He made two figures shaped like cherubim, overlaid them with gold, and placed them in the most holy place. The total wingspan of the two cherubim standing side by side was 30 feet. One wing of the first figure was seven and a half feet long, and it touched the temple wall. The other wing, also seven and a half feet long, touched one of the wings of the second figure. In the same way, the second figure had one wing seven one slash two feet long that touched the opposite wall. The other wing, also seven and a half feet long, touched the wing of the first figure. So the wingspan of the two cherubim side by side was thirty feet. 
They stood on their feet and faced out toward the main room of the temple. Across the entrance of the most holy place he hung a curtain made of fine linen, decorated with blue, purple, and scarlet thread and embroidered with figures of cherubim. For the front of the temple, he made two pillars that were twenty-seven feet tall, each topped by a capital extending upward another seven and a half feet. He made a network of interwoven chains and used them to decorate the tops of the pillars. He also made one hundred decorative pomegranates and attached them to the chains. Then he set up the two pillars at the entrance of the temple, one to the south of the entrance and the other to the north. He named the one on the south Jachin, and the one on the north Boaz. Solomon also made a bronze altar thirty feet long, thirty feet wide, and fifteen feet high. Then he cast a great round basin, fifteen feet across from rim to rim, called the sea. It was seven and a half feet deep and about forty-five feet in circumference. It was encircled just below its rim by two rows of figures that resembled oxen. There were about six oxen per foot all the way around, and they were cast as part of the basin. The sea was placed on a base of twelve bronze oxen, all facing outward. Three faced north, three faced west, three faced south, and three faced east, and the sea rested on them. The walls of the sea were about three inches thick, and its rim flared out like a cup and resembled a water lily blossom. It could hold about 16,500 gallons of water. He also made ten smaller basins for washing the utensils for the burnt offerings. He set five on the south side and five on the north. But the priests washed themselves in the sea. He then cast ten gold lampstands according to the specifications that had been given, and he put them in the temple. Five were placed against the south wall, and five were placed against the north wall. He also built ten tables and placed them in the temple, five along the south wall and five along the north wall. Then he molded one hundred gold basins. He then built a courtyard for the priests, and also the large outer courtyard. He made doors for the courtyard entrances and overlaid them with bronze. The great bronze basin called the sea was placed near the southeast corner of the temple. Hiram A.B. also made the necessary wash basins, shovels, and bowls. So at last Hiram A.B.I. completed everything King Solomon had assigned him to make for the temple of God. The Two Pillars The two bowl-shaped capitals on top of the pillars the two networks of interwoven chains that decorated the capitals. The four hundred pomegranates that hung from the chains on the capitals, two rows of pomegranates for each of the chain networks that decorated the capitals on top of the pillars. The water carts holding the basins. The sea and the twelve oxen under it. The ash buckets, the shovels, the meat hooks, and all the related articles. Hiram Abi made all these things of burnished bronze for the temple of the Lord, just as King Solomon had directed. The king had them cast in clay molds in the Jordan Valley between Sukkot and Zarethan. Solomon used such great quantities of bronze that its weight could not be determined. Solomon also made all the furnishings for the temple of God the gold altar. The tables for the bread of the presence. The lampstands and their lamps of solid gold, to burn in front of the most holy place as prescribed. The flower decorations, lamps, and tongs, all of the purest gold. The lamp snuffers, bowls, ladles, and incense burners, all of solid gold. The doors for the entrances to the most holy place and the main room of the temple, overlaid with gold. So Solomon finished all his work on the temple of the Lord. Then he brought all the gifts his father, David, had dedicated, the silver, the gold, and the various articles, and he stored them in the treasuries of the temple of God. 
Solomon then summoned to Jerusalem the elders of Israel and all the heads of tribes, the leaders of the ancestral families of Israel. They were to bring the Ark of the Lord's Covenant to the temple from its location in the city of David, also known as Zion. So all the men of Israel assembled before the king at the annual festival of shelters, which is held in early autumn. When all the elders of Israel arrived, the Levites picked up the Arkansas. The priests and Levites brought up the ark along with the special tent and all the sacred items that had been in it. There, before the ark, King Solomon and the entire community of Israel sacrificed so many sheep, goats, and cattle that no one could keep count. Then the priests carried the Ark of the Lord's Covenant into the inner sanctuary of the temple, the most holy place, and placed it beneath the wings of the cherubim. The cherubim spread their wings over the Ark, forming a canopy over the Ark and its carrying poles. These poles were so long that their ends could be seen from the holy place, which is in front of the most holy place, but not from the outside. They are still there to this day. Nothing was in the ark except the two stone tablets that Moses had placed in it at Mount Sinai, where the Lord made a covenant with the people of Israel when they left Egypt. Then the priests left the holy place. All the priests who were present had purified themselves, whether or not they were on duty that day. And the Levites who were musicians, Azaph, Heman, Jeduthun, and all their sons and brothers, were dressed in fine linen robes and stood at the east side of the altar playing cymbals, lyres, and harps. They were joined by 120 priests who were playing trumpets. The trumpeters and singers performed together in unison to praise and give thanks to the Lord. Accompanied by trumpets, cymbals, and other instruments, they raised their voices and praised the Lord with these words, He is good. His faithful love endures forever. At that moment a thick cloud filled the temple of the Lord. The priests could not continue their service because of the cloud, for the glorious presence of the Lord filled the temple of God. Then Solomon prayed, O Lord, you have said that you would live in a thick cloud of darkness. Now I have built a glorious temple for you, a place where you can live forever. Then the king turned around to the entire community of Israel standing before him and gave this blessing. Praise the Lord, the God of Israel, who has kept the promise he made to my father, David. For he told my father, From the day I brought my people out of the land of Egypt, I have never chosen a city among any of the tribes of Israel as the place where a temple should be built to honor my name. Nor have I chosen a king to lead my people Israel. But now I have chosen Jerusalem as the place for my name to be honored, and I have chosen David to be king over my people Israel. Then Solomon said, My father, David, wanted to build this temple to honor the name of the Lord, the God of Israel. But the Lord told him, You wanted to build the temple to honor my name. Your intention is good. But you are not the one to do it. One of your own sons will build the temple to honor me. And now the Lord has fulfilled the promise he made, for I have become king in my father's place, and now I sit on the throne of Israel, just as the Lord promised. I have built this temple to honor the name of the Lord, the God of Israel. There I have placed the ark, which contains the covenant that the Lord made with the people of Israel. Then Solomon stood before the altar of the Lord in front of the entire community of Israel, and he lifted his hands in prayer. Now Solomon had made a bronze platform seven and a half feet long, seven and a half feet wide, and four and a half feet high and had placed it at the center of the temple's outer courtyard. He stood on the platform, and then he knelt in front of the entire community of Israel and lifted his hands toward heaven. He prayed, O Lord, God of Israel, there is no God like you in all of heaven and earth. 
You keep your covenant and show unfailing love to all who walk before you in wholehearted devotion. You have kept your promise to your servant David, my father. You made that promise with your own mouth, and with your own hands you have fulfilled it today. And now, O Lord, God of Israel, carry out the additional promise you made to your servant David, my father. For you said to him, If your descendants guard their behavior and faithfully follow my law as you have done, one of them will always sit on the throne of Israel. Now, O Lord, God of Israel, fulfill this promise to your servant David. But will God really live on earth among people? Why, even the highest heavens cannot contain you. How much less this temple I have built. Nevertheless, listen to my prayer and my plea, O Lord my God. Hear the cry and the prayer that your servant is making to you. May you watch over this temple day and night, this place where you have said you would put your name. May you always hear the prayers I make toward this place. May you hear the humble and earnest requests from me and your people Israel when we pray toward this place. Yes, hear us from heaven where you live, and when you hear, forgive. If someone wrongs another person and is required to take an oath of innocence in front of your altar at this temple, 23 Then hear from heaven and judge between your servants, the accuser and the accused. Pay back the guilty as they deserve. Acquit the innocent because of their innocence. If your people Israel are defeated by their enemies because they have sinned against you, and if they turn back and acknowledge your name and pray to you here in this temple, 25 Then hear from heaven and forgive the sin of your people Israel and return them to this land you gave to them and to their ancestors. If the skies are shut up and there is no rain because your people have sinned against you, and if they pray toward this temple and acknowledge your name and turn from their sins because you have punished them. Then hear from heaven and forgive the sins of your servants, your people Israel. Teach them to follow the right path, and send rain on your land that you have given to your people as their special possession. If there is a famine in the land or a plague or crop disease or attacks of locusts or caterpillars, or if your people's enemies are in the land besieging their towns, whatever disaster or disease there is. And if your people Israel pray about their troubles or sorrow, raising their hands toward this temple, then hear from heaven where you live, and forgive. Give your people what their actions deserve, for you alone know each human heart. Then they will fear you and walk in your ways as long as they live in the land you gave to our ancestors. In the future, foreigners who do not belong to your people Israel will hear of you. They will come from distant lands when they hear of your great name and your strong hand and your powerful arm. And when they pray toward this temple. Then hear from heaven where you live, and grant what they ask of you. In this way, all the people of the earth will come to know and fear you, just as your own people Israel do. They, too, will know that this temple I have built honors your name. If your people go out where you send them to fight their enemies, and if they pray to you by turning toward this city you have chosen and toward this temple I have built to honor your name, 35 Then hear their prayers from heaven and uphold their cause. If they sin against you, and who has never sinned, you might become angry with them and let their enemies conquer them and take them captive to a foreign land far away or near. 37 But in that land of exile, they might turn to you in repentance and pray, We have sinned, done evil, and acted wickedly. If they turn to you with their whole heart and soul in the land of their captivity and pray toward the land you gave to their ancestors, toward this city you have chosen, and toward this temple I have built to honor your name. Then hear their prayers and their petitions from heaven where you live, and uphold their cause. Forgive your people who have sinned against you. O oh my God, may your eyes be open and your ears attentive to all the prayers made to you in this place. And now arise, 
O Lord God, and enter your resting place. Along with the ark, the symbol of your power. May your priests, O Lord God, be clothed with salvation. May your loyal servants rejoice in your goodness. O Lord God, do not reject the king you have anointed. Remember your unfailing love for your servant David. When Solomon finished praying, fire flashed down from heaven and burned up the burnt offerings and sacrifices, and the glorious presence of the Lord filled the temple. The priests could not enter the temple of the Lord because the glorious presence of the Lord filled it. When all the people of Israel saw the fire coming down and the glorious presence of the Lord filling the temple, they fell face down on the ground and worshipped and praised the Lord, saying, He is good. His faithful love endures forever. Then the king and all the people offered sacrifices to the Lord. King Solomon offered a sacrifice of 22,000 cattle and 120,000 sheep and goats. And so the king and all the people dedicated the temple of God. The priests took their assigned positions, and so did the Levites who were singing, His faithful love endures forever. They accompanied the singing with music from the instruments King David had made for praising the Lord. Across from the Levites, the priests blew the trumpets, while all Israel stood. Solomon then consecrated the central area of the courtyard in front of the Lord's temple. He offered burnt offerings and the fat of peace offerings there, because the bronze altar he had built could not hold all the burnt offerings, grain offerings, and sacrificial fat. For the next seven days Solomon and all Israel celebrated the festival of shelters. A large congregation had gathered from as far away as Lebohamoth in the north and the brook of Egypt in the south. On the eighth day they had a closing ceremony, for they had celebrated the dedication of the altar for seven days and the festival of shelters for seven days. Ten then at the end of the celebration, Solomon sent the people home. They were all joyful and glad because the Lord had been so good to David and to Solomon and to his people Israel. So Solomon finished the temple of the Lord, as well as the royal palace. He completed everything he had planned to do in the construction of the temple and the palace. Then one night the Lord appeared to Solomon and said, I have heard your prayer and have chosen this temple as the place for making sacrifices. At times I might shut up the heavens so that no rain falls, or command grasshoppers to devour your crops or send plagues among you. Then if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sins and restore their land. My eyes will be open and my ears attentive to every prayer made in this place. For I have chosen this temple and set it apart to be holy, a place where my name will be honored forever. I will always watch over it, for it is dear to my heart. As for you, if you faithfully follow me as David your father did, obeying all my commands, decrees, and regulations, then I will establish the throne of your dynasty. For I made this covenant with your father, David, when I said, One of your descendants will always rule over Israel. But if you or your descendants abandon me and disobey the decrees and commands I have given you, and if you serve and worship other gods, then I will uproot the people from this land that I have given them. I will reject this temple that I have made holy to honor my name. I will make it an object of mockery and ridicule among the nations. And though this temple is impressive now, all who pass by will be appalled. They will ask, Why did the Lord do such terrible things to this land and to this temple? And the answer will be, Because his people abandoned the Lord, the God of their ancestors, who brought them out of Egypt, and they worshipped other gods instead and bowed down to them. That is why he has brought all these disasters on them. 
It took Solomon twenty years to build the Lord's temple and his own royal palace. At the end of that time, Solomon turned his attention to rebuilding the towns that King Hiram had given him, and he settled Israelites in them. Solomon also fought against the town of Hamath Zobah and conquered it. He rebuilt Tadmor in the wilderness and built towns in the region of Hamath as supply centers. He fortified the towns of Upper Beth Horon and Lower Beth Horon, rebuilding their walls and installing barred gates. He also rebuilt Balath and other supply centers and constructed towns where his chariots and horses could be stationed. He built everything he desired in Jerusalem and Lebanon and throughout his entire realm. There were still some people living in the land who were not Israelites, including the Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. These were descendants of the nations whom the people of Israel had not destroyed. So Solomon conscripted them for his labor force, and they serve as forced laborers to this day. But Solomon did not conscript any of the Israelites for his labor force. Instead, he assigned them to serve as fighting men, officers in his army, commanders of his chariots, and charioteers. King Solomon appointed 250 of them to supervise the people. Solomon moved his wife, Pharaoh's daughter, from the city of David to the new palace he had built for her. He said, My wife must not live in King David's palace, for the ark of the Lord has been there, and it is holy ground. Then Solomon presented burnt offerings to the Lord on the altar he had built for him in front of the entry room of the temple. He offered the sacrifices for the Sabbaths, the New Moon Festivals, and the three annual festivals, the Passover celebration, the Festival of Harvest, and the Festival of Shelters, as Moses had commanded. In assigning the priests to their duties, Solomon followed the regulations of his father, David. He also assigned the Levites to lead the people in praise and to assist the priests in their daily duties. And he assigned the gatekeepers to their gates by their divisions, following the commands of David, the man of God. Solomon did not deviate in any way from David's commands concerning the priests and Levites and the treasuries. So Solomon made sure that all the work related to building the temple of the Lord was carried out, from the day its foundation was laid to the day of its completion. Later Solomon went to Ezi and Geber and Elath, ports along the shore of the Red Sea in the land of Edom. Hiram sent him ships commanded by his own officers and manned by experienced crews of sailors. These ships sailed to Ophir with Solomon's men and brought back to Solomon almost 17 tons of gold. When the Queen of Sheba heard of Solomon's fame, she came to Jerusalem to test him with hard questions. She arrived with a large group of attendants and a great caravan of camels loaded with spices, large quantities of gold, and precious jewels. When she met with Solomon, she talked with him about everything she had on her mind. Solomon had answers for all her questions, nothing was too hard for him to explain to her. When the Queen of Sheba realized how wise Solomon was, and when she saw the palace he had built, she was overwhelmed. She was also amazed at the food on his tables, the organization of his officials and their splendid clothing, the cupbearers, and their robes, and the burnt offering Solomon made at the temple of the Lord. She exclaimed to the king, Everything I heard in my country about your achievements and wisdom is true. I didn't believe what was said until I arrived here and saw it with my own eyes. In fact, I had not heard the half of your great wisdom. It is far beyond what I was told. How happy your people must be! What a privilege for your officials to stand here day after day, listening to your wisdom. Praise the Lord your God, who delights in you and has placed you on the throne as king to rule for him. Because God loves Israel and desires this kingdom to last forever, 
He has made you king over them so you can rule with justice and righteousness. Then she gave the king a gift of nine thousand pounds of gold, great quantities of spices, and precious jewels. Never before had there been spices as fine as those the Queen of Sheba gave to King Solomon. In addition, the crews of Hiram and Solomon brought gold from Ophir, and they also brought red sandalwood and precious jewels. The king used the sandalwood to make steps for the temple of the Lord and the royal palace, and to construct lyres and harps for the musicians. Never before had such beautiful things been seen in Judah. King Solomon gave the Queen of Sheba whatever she asked for, gifts of greater value than the gifts she had given him. Then she and all her attendants returned to their own land. Each year Solomon received about 25 tons of gold. This did not include the additional revenue he received from merchants and traders. All the kings of Arabia and the governors of the provinces also brought gold and silver to Solomon. King Solomon made 200 large shields of hammered gold, each weighing more than 15 pounds. He also made 300 smaller shields of hammered gold, each weighing more than seven and a half pounds. The king placed these shields in the palace of the forest of Lebanon. Then the king made a huge throne, decorated with ivory and overlaid with pure gold. The throne had six steps, with a footstool of gold. There were armrests on both sides of the seat, and the figure of a lion stood on each side of the throne. There were also twelve other lions, one standing on each end of the six steps. No other throne in all the world could be compared with it. All of King Solomon's drinking cups were solid gold, as were all the utensils in the palace of the forest of Lebanon. They were not made of silver, for silver was considered worthless in Solomon's day. The king had a fleet of trading ships of Tarshish manned by the sailors sent by Hiram. Once every three years the ships returned, loaded with gold, silver, ivory, apes, and peacocks. So King Solomon became richer and wiser than any other king on earth. Kings from every nation came to consult him and to hear the wisdom God had given him. Year after year everyone who visited brought him gifts of silver and gold, clothing, weapons, spices, horses, and mules. Solomon had 4,000 stalls for his horses and chariots, and he had 12,000 horses. He stationed some of them in the chariot cities, and some near him in Jerusalem. He ruled over all the kings from the Euphrates River in the north to the land of the Philistines and the border of Egypt in the south. The king made silver as plentiful in Jerusalem as stone. And valuable cedar timber was as common as the sycamore fig trees that grow in the foothills of Judah. Solomon's horses were imported from Egypt and many other countries. The rest of the events of Solomon's reign, from beginning to end, are recorded in the record of Nathan the prophet, and the prophecy of Ahijah from Shiloh, and also in the visions of Edo the seer, concerning Jeroboam's son of Nebat. Solomon ruled in Jerusalem over all Israel for forty years. When he died, he was buried in the city of David, named for his father. Then his son Rehoboam became the next king. Rehoboam went to Shechem, where all Israel had gathered to make him king. When Jeroboam son of Nebat heard of this, he returned from Egypt, for he had fled to Egypt to escape from King Solomon. The leaders of Israel summoned him, and Jeroboam and all Israel went to speak with Rehoboam. Your father was a hard master, they said. Lighten the harsh labor demands and heavy taxes that your father imposed on us. Then we will be your loyal subjects. Rehoboam replied, Come back in three days for my answer. So the people went away. Then King Rehoboam discussed the matter with the older men who had counseled his father, Solomon. What is your advice? he asked. 
How should I answer these people? The older counselors replied, If you are good to these people and do your best to please them and give them a favorable answer, they will always be your loyal subjects. But Rehoboam rejected the advice of the older men and instead asked the opinion of the young men who had grown up with him and were now his advisors. What is your advice? he asked them. How should I answer these people who want me to lighten the burdens imposed by my father? The young men replied, This is what you should tell those complainers who want a lighter burden, my little finger is thicker than my father's waist. Yes, my father laid heavy burdens on you, but I'm going to make them even heavier. My father beat you with whips, but I will beat you with scorpions. Three days later Jeroboam and all the people returned to hear Rehoboam's decision, just as the king had ordered. But Rehoboam spoke harshly to them, for he rejected the advice of the older counselors, and followed the counsel of his younger advisors. He told the people, My father laid heavy burdens on you, but I'm going to make them even heavier. My father beat you with whips, but I will beat you with scorpions. So the king paid no attention to the people. This turn of events was the will of God, for it fulfilled the Lord's message to Jeroboam son of Nebat through the prophet Ahijah from Shiloh. When all Israel realized that the king had refused to listen to them, they responded, Down with the dynasty of David. We have no interest in the son of Jesse. Back to your homes, O Israel. Look out for your own house, O David. So all the people of Israel returned home. But Rehoboam continued to rule over the Israelites who lived in the towns of Judah. King Rehoboam sent Adoniram, who was in charge of forced labor, to restore order, but the people of Israel stoned him to death. When this news reached King Rehoboam, he quickly jumped into his chariot and fled to Jerusalem. And to this day the northern tribes of Israel have refused to be ruled by a descendant of David. When Rehoboam arrived at Jerusalem, he mobilized the men of Judah and Benjamin, 180,000 select troops, to fight against Israel and to restore the kingdom to himself. But the Lord said to Shemaiah, the man of God, Say to Rehoboam son of Solomon, king of Judah, and to all the Israelites in Judah and Benjamin. This is what the Lord says, Do not fight against your relatives. Go back home, for what has happened is my doing. So they obeyed the message of the Lord and did not fight against Jeroboam. Rehoboam remained in Jerusalem and fortified various towns for the defense of Judah. He built up Bethlehem, Etam, Tico, Beth Zur, Soko, Adullam, Gath, Mershah, Ziph, Adarame, Lachish, Azika, Zora, Igelin, and Hebron. These became the fortified towns of Judah and Benjamin. Rehoboam strengthened their defenses and stationed commanders in them, and he stored supplies of food, olive oil, and wine. He also put shields and spears in these towns as a further safety measure. So only Judah and Benjamin remained under his control. But all the priests and Levites living among the northern tribes of Israel sided with Rehoboam. 14 The Levites even abandoned their pasturelands and property and moved to Judah and Jerusalem, because Jeroboam and his sons would not allow them to serve the Lord as priests. Jeroboam appointed his own priests to serve at the pagan shrines, where they worshipped the goat and calf idols he had made. From all the tribes of Israel, those who sincerely wanted to worship the Lord, the God of Israel, followed the Levites to Jerusalem, where they could offer sacrifices to the Lord, the God of their ancestors. This strengthened the kingdom of Judah, and for three years they supported Rehoboam's son of Solomon, for during those years they faithfully followed in the footsteps of David and Solomon. Rehoboam married his cousin Mahalath, 
the daughter of David's son Jeremoth and of Abihail, the daughter of Eliab's son of Jesse. Mahalath had three sons, Jush, Shemariah, and Zaim. Later Rehoboam married another cousin, Maka, the granddaughter of Absalom. Maka gave birth to Abijah, Atai, Ziza, and Shelemith. Rehoboam loved Maka more than any of his other wives and concubines. In all, he had eighteen wives and sixty concubines, and they gave birth to twenty-eight sons and sixty daughters. Rehoboam appointed Maka a son Abijah as leader among the princes, making it clear that he would be the next king. Rehoboam also wisely gave responsibilities to his other sons and stationed some of them in the fortified towns throughout the land of Judah and Benjamin. He provided them with generous provisions, and he found many wives for them. But when Rehoboam was firmly established and strong, he abandoned the law of the Lord, and all Israel followed him in this sin. Because they were unfaithful to the Lord, King Shishak of Egypt came up and attacked Jerusalem in the fifth year of King Rehoboam's reign. He came with 1,200 chariots, 60,000 horses, and a countless army of foot soldiers, including Libyans, Sukkites, and Ethiopians. Shishak conquered Judah's fortified towns and then advanced to attack Jerusalem. The prophet Shemaiah then met with Rehoboam and Judah's leaders, who had all fled to Jerusalem because of Shishak. Shemaiah told them, This is what the Lord says, You have abandoned me, so I am abandoning you to Shishak. Then the leaders of Israel and the king humbled themselves and said, The Lord is right in doing this to us. When the Lord saw their change of heart, he gave this message to Shemaiah, Since the people have humbled themselves, I will not completely destroy them and will soon give them some relief. I will not use Shishak to pour out my anger on Jerusalem. But they will become his subjects, so they will know the difference between serving me and serving earthly rulers. So King Shishak of Egypt came up and attacked Jerusalem. He ransacked the treasuries of the Lord's temple and the royal palace, he stole everything, including all the gold shields Solomon had made. King Rehoboam later replaced them with bronze shields as substitutes, and he entrusted them to the care of the commanders of the guard who protected the entrance to the royal palace. Whenever the king went to the temple of the Lord, the guards would also take the shields and then return them to the guardroom. Because Rehoboam humbled himself, the Lord's anger was turned away, and he did not destroy him completely. There were still some good things in the land of Judah. King Rehoboam firmly established himself in Jerusalem and continued to rule. He was 41 years old when he became king, and he reigned 17 years in Jerusalem, the city the Lord had chosen from among all the tribes of Israel as the place to honor his name. Rehoboam's mother was Naamah, a woman from Ammon. But he was an evil king, for he did not seek the Lord with all his heart. The rest of the events of Rehoboam's reign, from beginning to end, are recorded in the record of Shemaiah the prophet and the record of Iddo the seer, which are part of the genealogical record. Rehoboam and Jeroboam were continually at war with each other. When Rehoboam died, he was buried in the city of David. Then his son Abijah became the next king. Abijah began to rule over Judah in the 18th year of Jeroboam's reign in Israel. He reigned in Jerusalem three years. His mother was Makkah, the daughter of Uriel from Gibeah, then war broke out between Abijah and Jeroboam. Judah, led by King Abijah, fielded 400,000 select warriors, 
while Jeroboam mustered 800,000 select troops from Israel. When the army of Judah arrived in the hill country of Ephraim, Abijah stood on Mount Zemaraim and shouted to Jeroboam and all Israel, Listen to me. Don't you realize that the Lord, the God of Israel, made a lasting covenant with David, giving him and his descendants the throne of Israel forever? Yet Jeroboam son of Nebat, a mere servant of David's son Solomon, rebelled against his master. Then a whole gang of scoundrels joined him, defying Solomon's son Rehoboam when he was young and inexperienced and could not stand up to them. Do you really think you can stand against the kingdom of the Lord that is led by the descendants of David? You may have a vast army, and you have those gold calves that Jeroboam made as your gods. But you have chased away the priests of the Lord, the descendants of Aaron, and the Levites, and you have appointed your own priests, just like the pagan nations. You let anyone become a priest these days. Whoever comes to be dedicated with a young bull and seven rams can become a priest of these so-called gods of yours. But as for us, the Lord is our God, and we have not abandoned him. Only the descendants of Aaron serve the Lord as priests, and the Levites alone may help them in their work. They present burnt offerings and fragrant incense to the Lord every morning and evening. They place the bread of the presence on the holy table, and they light the gold lampstand every evening. We are following the instructions of the Lord our God, but you have abandoned him. So you see, God is with us. He is our leader. His priests blow their trumpets and lead us into battle against you. O people of Israel, do not fight against the Lord, the God of your ancestors, for you will not succeed. Meanwhile, Jeroboam had secretly sent part of his army around behind the men of Judah to ambush them. When Judah realized that they were being attacked from the front and the rear, they cried out to the Lord for help. Then the priests blew the trumpets. And the men of Judah began to shout. At the sound of their battle cry, God defeated Jeroboam and all Israel and routed them before Abijah and the army of Judah. The Israelite army fled from Judah, and God handed them over to Judah in defeat. Abijah and his army inflicted heavy losses on them, 500,000 of Israel's select troops were killed that day. So Judah defeated Israel on that occasion because they trusted in the Lord, the God of their ancestors. Abijah and his army pursued Jeroboam's troops and captured some of his towns, including Bethel, Jeshana, and Ephron, along with their surrounding villages. So Jeroboam of Israel never regained his power during Abijah's lifetime, and finally the Lord struck him down and he died. Meanwhile, Abijah of Judah grew more and more powerful. He married 14 wives and had 22 sons and 16 daughters. The rest of the events of Abijah's reign, including his words and deeds, are recorded in the commentary of Ido the prophet. When Abijah died, he was buried in the city of David. Then his son Asa became the next king. There was peace in the land for ten years. Asa did what was pleasing and good in the sight of the Lord his God. He removed the foreign altars and the pagan shrines. He smashed the sacred pillars and cut down the Asherah poles. He commanded the people of Judah to seek the Lord, the God of their ancestors, and to obey his law and his commands. Asa also removed the pagan shrines, as well as the incense altars from every one of Judah's towns. So Asa's kingdom enjoyed a period of peace. During those peaceful years, he was able to build up the fortified towns throughout Judah. No one tried to make war against him at this time, for the Lord was giving him rest from his enemies. Asa told the people of Judah, Let us build towns and fortify them with walls, towers, gates, and bars. The land is still ours because we sought the Lord our God, 
and he has given us peace on every side. So they went ahead with these projects and brought them to completion. King Asa had an army of 300,000 warriors from the tribe of Judah, armed with large shields and spears. He also had an army of 280,000 warriors from the tribe of Benjamin, armed with small shields and bows. Both armies were composed of well-trained fighting men. Once an Ethiopian named Zira attacked Judah with an army of 1 million men and 300 chariots. They advanced to the town of Mershah. So Asa deployed his armies for battle in the valley north of Mershah. Then Asa cried out to the Lord his God, O Lord, no one but you can help the powerless against the mighty. Help us, O Lord our God, for we trust in you alone. It is in your name that we have come against this vast horde. O Lord, you are our God, do not let mere men prevail against you. So the Lord defeated the Ethiopians in the presence of Asa and the army of Judah, and the enemy fled. Asa and his army pursued them as far as Gerar, and so many Ethiopians fell that they were unable to rally. They were destroyed by the Lord and his army, and the army of Judah carried off a vast amount of plunder. While they were at Gerar, they attacked all the towns in that area, and terror from the Lord came upon the people there. As a result, a vast amount of plunder was taken from these towns, too. They also attacked the camps of herdsmen and captured many sheep, goats, and camels before finally returning to Jerusalem. Then the Spirit of God came upon Azariah son of Oded, too, and he went out to meet King Asa as he was returning from the battle. Listen to me, Asa, he shouted. Listen, all you people of Judah and Benjamin. The Lord will stay with you as long as you stay with him. Whenever you seek him, you will find him. But if you abandon him, he will abandon you. For a long time Israel was without the true God, without a priest to teach them, and without the law to instruct them. But whenever they were in trouble and turned to the Lord, the God of Israel, and sought him out, they found him. During those dark times, it was not safe to travel. Problems troubled the people of every land. Nation fought against nation, and city against city, for God was troubling them with every kind of problem. But as for you, be strong and courageous, for your work will be rewarded. When Asa heard this message from Azariah the prophet, he took courage and removed all the detestable idols from the land of Judah and Benjamin and in the towns he had captured in the hill country of Ephraim. And he repaired the altar of the Lord, which stood in front of the entry room of the Lord's temple. Then Asa called together all the people of Judah and Benjamin, along with the people of Ephraim, Manasseh, and Simeon who had settled among them. For many from Israel had moved to Judah during Asa's reign when they saw that the Lord his God was with him. The people gathered at Jerusalem in late spring, during the fifteenth year of Asa's reign. On that day they sacrificed to the Lord seven hundred cattle and seven thousand sheep and goats from the plunder they had taken in the battle. Then they entered into a covenant to seek the Lord, the God of their ancestors, with all their heart and soul. They agreed that anyone who refused to seek the Lord, the God of Israel, would be put to death, whether young or old, man or woman. They shouted out their oath of loyalty to the Lord with trumpets blaring and ram's horns sounding. All in Judah were happy about this covenant, for they had entered into it with all their heart. They earnestly sought after God, and they found Him. And the Lord gave them rest from their enemies on every side. King Asa even deposed his grandmother Maka from her position as queen mother because she had made an obscene Asherah pole. He cut down her obscene pole, broke it up, and burned it in the Kidron Valley. Although the pagan shrines were not removed from Israel, Asa's heart remained completely faithful throughout his life. 
He brought into the temple of God the silver and gold and the various items that he and his father had dedicated. So there was no more war until the thirty-fifth year of Asa's reign. In the thirty-sixth year of Asa's reign, King Basha of Israel invaded Judah and fortified Ramah in order to prevent anyone from entering or leaving King Asa's territory in Judah. Asa responded by removing the silver and gold from the treasuries of the Temple of the Lord and the Royal Palace. He sent it to King Ben-Hadad of Aram, who was ruling in Damascus, along with this message. Let there be a treaty between you and me like the one between your father and my father. See, I am sending you silver and gold. Break your treaty with King Basha of Israel so that he will leave me alone. Ben-Hadad agreed to King Asa's request and sent the commanders of his army to attack the towns of Israel. They conquered the towns of Aijan, Dan, abel beth Maka, and all the store cities in Naphtali. As soon as Basha of Israel heard what was happening, he abandoned his project of fortifying Ramah and stopped all work on it. Then King Asa called out all the men of Judah to carry away the building stones and timbers that Basha had been using to fortify Ramah. Asa used these materials to fortify the towns of Geba and Mizpah. At that time Hanani the seer came to King Asa and told him, Because you have put your trust in the king of Aram instead of in the Lord your God, you missed your chance to destroy the army of the king of Aram. Don't you remember what happened to the Ethiopians and Libyans and their vast army, with all of their chariots and charioteers? At that time you relied on the Lord, and he handed them over to you. The eyes of the Lord searched the whole earth in order to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. What a fool you have been! From now on you will be at war. Asa became so angry with Hanani for saying this that he threw him into prison and put him in stocks. At that time Asa also began to oppress some of his people. The rest of the events of Asa's reign, from beginning to end, are recorded in the book of the kings of Judah and Israel. In the thirty-ninth year of his reign, Asa developed a serious foot disease. Yet even with the severity of his disease, he did not seek the Lord's help but turned only to his physicians. So he died in the forty-first year of his reign. He was buried in the tomb he had carved out for himself in the city of David. He was laid on a bed perfumed with sweet spices and fragrant ointments, and the people built a huge funeral fire in his honor. Then Jehoshaphat, Asa's son, became the next king. He strengthened Judah to stand against any attack from Israel. He stationed troops in all the fortified towns of Judah, and he assigned additional garrisons to the land of Judah and to the towns of Ephraim that his father, Asa, had captured. The Lord was with Jehoshaphat because he followed the example of his father's early years and did not worship the images of Baal. He sought his father's God and obeyed his commands instead of following the evil practices of the kingdom of Israel. So the Lord established Jehoshaphat's control over the kingdom of Judah. All the people of Judah brought gifts to Jehoshaphat, so he became very wealthy and highly esteemed. He was deeply committed to the ways of the Lord. He removed the pagan shrines and Asherah poles from Judah. In the third year of his reign Jehoshaphat sent his officials to teach in all the towns of Judah. These officials included Ben-Hale, Obadiah, Zechariah, Nethanel, and Micaiah. He sent Levites along with them, including Shemaiah, Nethaniah, Zebadiah, Asahel, Shemiramoth, Jehonathan, Adonijah, Tabijah, and Tabadonijah. He also sent out the priests Elishama and Jehoram. They took copies of the book of the law of the Lord and traveled around through all the towns of Judah, teaching the people. Then the fear of the Lord fell over all the surrounding kingdoms so that none of them wanted to declare war on Jehoshaphat. 
Some of the Philistines brought him gifts and silver as tribute, and the Arabs brought 7,700 rams and 7,700 male goats. So Jehoshaphat became more and more powerful and built fortresses and storage cities throughout Judah. He stored numerous supplies in Judah's towns and stationed an army of seasoned troops at Jerusalem. His army was enrolled according to ancestral clans, from Judah there were 300,000 troops organized in units of 1,000, under the command of Adna. Next in command was Jehohanan, who commanded 280,000 troops. Next was Amasiah son of Zikri, who volunteered for the Lord's service, with 200,000 troops under his command. From Benjamin there were 200,000 troops equipped with bows and shields. They were under the command of Eliada, a veteran soldier. Next in command was Jehazabad, who commanded 180,000 armed men. These were the troops stationed in Jerusalem to serve the king, besides those Jehoshaphat stationed in the fortified towns throughout Judah. Jehoshaphat enjoyed great riches and high esteem, and he made an alliance with Ahab of Israel by having his son marry Ahab's daughter. A few years later he went to Samaria to visit Ahab, who prepared a great banquet for him and his officials. They butchered great numbers of sheep, goats, and cattle for the feast. Then Ahab enticed Jehoshaphat to join forces with him to recover Ramoth Gilead. Will you go with me to Ramoth Gilead? King Ahab of Israel asked King Jehoshaphat of Judah, Jehoshaphat replied, Why, of course. You and I are as one, and my troops are your troops. We will certainly join you in battle. Then Jehoshaphat added, But first let's find out what the Lord says. So the king of Israel summoned the prophets, four hundred of them, and asked them, Should we go to war against Ramoth Gilead, or should I hold back? They all replied, Yes, go right ahead. God will give the king victory. But Jehoshaphat asked, Is there not also a prophet of the Lord here? We should ask him the same question. The king of Israel replied to Jehoshaphat, There is one more man who could consult the Lord for us, but I hate him. He never prophesies anything but trouble for me. His name is Micaiah son of Imla. Jehoshaphat replied, That's not the way a king should talk. Let's hear what he has to say. So the king of Israel called one of his officials and said, Quick! Bring Micaiah son of Imla. King Ahab of Israel and King Jehoshaphat of Judah, dressed in their royal robes, were sitting on thrones at the threshing floor near the gate of Samaria. All of Ahab's prophets were prophesying there in front of them. One of them, Zedekiah son of Kanana, made some iron horns and proclaimed, This is what the Lord says, With these horns you will gore the Arameans to death. All the other prophets agreed. Yes, they said, Go up to Ramoth Gilead and be victorious, for the Lord will give the king victory. Meanwhile, the messenger who went to get Micaiah said to him, Look, all the prophets are promising victory for the king. Be sure that you agree with them and promise success. But Micaiah replied, As surely as the Lord lives, I will say only what my God says. When Micaiah arrived before the king, Ahab asked him, Micaiah, should we go to war against Ramoth Gilead, or should I hold back? Micaiah replied sarcastically, Yes, go up and be victorious, for you will have victory over them. But the king replied sharply, How many times must I demand that you speak only the truth to me when you speak for the Lord? Then Micaiah told him, In a vision I saw all Israel scattered on the mountains, like sheep without a shepherd. And the Lord said, Their master has been killed. Send them home in peace. Didn't I tell you, the king of Israel exclaimed to Jehoshaphat, 
He never prophesies anything but trouble for me. Then Micaiah continued, Listen to what the Lord says. I saw the Lord sitting on his throne with all the armies of heaven around him, on his right and on his left. And the Lord said, Who can entice King Ahab of Israel to go into battle against Ramoth Gilead so he can be killed? There were many suggestions. And finally a spirit approached the Lord and said, I can do it. How will you do this? the Lord asked. And the spirit replied, I will go out and inspire all of Ahab's prophets to speak lies. You will succeed, said the Lord. Go ahead and do it. So you see, the Lord has put a lying spirit in the mouths of your prophets. For the Lord has pronounced your doom. Then Zedekiah son of Kanana walked up to Micaiah and slapped him across the face. Since when did the Spirit of the Lord leave me to speak to you, he demanded. And Micaiah replied, You will find out soon enough when you are trying to hide in some secret room. Arrest him, the king of Israel ordered. Take him back to Ammon, the governor of the city, and to my son Josh. Give them this order from the king, put this man in prison, and feed him nothing but bread and water until I return safely from the battle. But Micaiah replied, If you return safely, it will mean that the Lord has not spoken through me. Then he added to those standing around, Everyone mark my words. So King Ahab of Israel and King Jehoshaphat of Judah led their armies against Ramoth Gilead. The king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, As we go into battle, I will disguise myself so no one will recognize me, but you wear your royal robes. So the king of Israel disguised himself, and they went into battle. Meanwhile, the king of Aram had issued these orders to his chariot commanders, Attack only the king of Israel. Don't bother with anyone else. So when the Aramean chariot commanders saw Jehoshaphat in his royal robes, they went after him. There is the king of Israel, they shouted. But Jehoshaphat called out, and the Lord saved him. God helped him by turning the attackers away from him. As soon as the chariot commanders realized he was not the king of Israel, they stopped chasing him. An Aramean soldier, however, randomly shot an arrow at the Israelite troops and hit the king of Israel between the joints of his armor. Turn the horses and get me out of here. Ahab groaned to the driver of the chariot. I'm badly wounded. The battle raged all that day, and the king of Israel propped himself up in his chariot facing the Arameans. In the evening, just as the sun was setting, he died. When King Jehoshaphat of Judah arrived safely home in Jerusalem, Jehu son of Hanani the seer went out to meet him. Why should you help the wicked and love those who hate the Lord, he asked the king. Because of what you have done, the Lord is very angry with you. Even so, there is some good in you, for you have removed the Asherah poles throughout the land, and you have committed yourself to seeking God. Jehoshaphat lived in Jerusalem, but he went out among the people, traveling from Beersheba to the hill country of Ephraim, encouraging the people to return to the Lord, the God of their ancestors. He appointed judges throughout the nation in all the fortified towns. And he said to them, Always think carefully before pronouncing judgment. Remember that you do not judge to please people but to please the Lord. He will be with you when you render the verdict in each case. Fear the Lord and judge with integrity, for the Lord our God does not tolerate perverted justice, partiality, or the taking of bribes. In Jerusalem, Jehoshaphat appointed some of the Levites and priests and clan leaders in Israel to serve as judges for cases involving the Lord's regulations and for civil disputes. These were his instructions to them, You must always act in the fear of the Lord, 
with faithfulness, and an undivided heart. Whenever a case comes to you from fellow citizens in an outlying town, whether a murder case or some other violation of God's laws, commands, decrees, or regulations, you must warn them not to sin against the Lord, so that He will not be angry with you and them. Do this and you will not be guilty. Amaria the high priest will have final say in all cases involving the Lord. Zebediah son of Ishmael, a leader from the tribe of Judah, will have final say in all civil cases. The Levites will assist you in making sure that justice is served. Take courage as you fulfill your duties, and may the Lord be with those who do what is right. After this, the armies of the Moabites, Ammonites, and some of the Munites declared war on Jehoshaphat. Messengers came and told Jehoshaphat, A vast army from Edom is marching against you from beyond the Dead Sea. They are already at Hazazon Tamar. This was another name for En Gedi. Jehoshaphat was terrified by this news and begged the Lord for guidance. He also ordered everyone in Judah to begin fasting. So people from all the towns of Judah came to Jerusalem to seek the Lord's help. Jehoshaphat stood before the community of Judah and Jerusalem in front of the new courtyard at the temple of the Lord. He prayed, O Lord, God of our ancestors, you alone are the God who is in heaven. You are ruler of all the kingdoms of the earth. You are powerful and mighty, no one can stand against you. O oh our God, did you not drive out those who lived in this land when your people Israel arrived? And did you not give this land forever to the descendants of your friend Abraham? Your people settled here and built this temple to honor your name. They said, Whenever we are faced with any calamity such as war, plague, or famine, we can come to stand in your presence before this temple where your name is honored. We can cry out to you to save us, and you will hear us and rescue us. And now see what the armies of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir are doing. You would not let our ancestors invade those nations when Israel left Egypt, so they went around them and did not destroy them. Now see how they reward us. For they have come to throw us out of your land, which you gave us as an inheritance. O oh our God, won't you stop them? We are powerless against this mighty army that is about to attack us. We do not know what to do, but we are looking to you for help. As all the men of Judah stood before the Lord with their little ones, wives, and children, the Spirit of the Lord came upon one of the men standing there. His name was Jehaziel son of Zechariah, son of Benaiah, son of Jeel, son of Metaniah, a Levite who was a descendant of Azaph. He said, Listen, all you people of Judah and Jerusalem. Listen, King Jehoshaphat. This is what the Lord says, Do not be afraid. Don't be discouraged by this mighty army, for the battle is not yours, but God's. Tomorrow, march out against them. You will find them coming up through the ascent of Ziz at the end of the valley that opens into the wilderness of Jeruel. But you will not even need to fight. Take your positions, then stand still and watch the Lord's victory. He is with you, O people of Judah and Jerusalem. Do not be afraid or discouraged. Go out against them tomorrow, for the Lord is with you. Then King Jehoshaphat bowed low with his face to the ground. And all the people of Judah and Jerusalem did the same, worshipping the Lord. Then the Levites from the clans of Kohath and Korah stood to praise the Lord, the God of Israel, with a very loud shout. Early the next morning the army of Judah went out into the wilderness of Tico. On the way Jehoshaphat stopped and said, Listen to me, all you people of Judah and Jerusalem. Believe in the Lord your God, and you will be able to stand firm. Believe in his prophets, and you will succeed. 
After consulting the people, the king appointed singers to walk ahead of the army, singing to the Lord and praising Him for His holy splendor. This is what they sang, Give thanks to the Lord. His faithful love endures forever. At the very moment they began to sing and give praise, the Lord caused the armies of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir to start fighting among themselves. The armies of Moab and Ammon turned against their allies from Mount Seir and killed every one of them. After they had destroyed the army of Seir, they began attacking each other. So when the army of Judah arrived at the lookout point in the wilderness, all they saw were dead bodies lying on the ground as far as they could see. Not a single one of the enemy had escaped. King Jehoshaphat and his men went out to gather the plunder. They found vast amounts of equipment, clothing, and other valuables, more than they could carry. There was so much plunder that it took them three days just to collect it all. On the fourth day they gathered in the Valley of Blessing, which got its name that day because the people praised and thanked the Lord there. It is still called the Valley of Blessing today. Then all the men returned to Jerusalem, with Jehoshaphat leading them, overjoyed that the Lord had given them victory over their enemies. They marched into Jerusalem to the music of harps, lyres, and trumpets, and they proceeded to the temple of the Lord. When all the surrounding kingdoms heard that the Lord himself had fought against the enemies of Israel, the fear of God came over them. So Jehoshaphat's kingdom was at peace, for his God had given him rest on every side. So Jehoshaphat ruled over the land of Judah. He was thirty-five years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem twenty-five years. His mother was Azubah, the daughter of Shilhai. Jehoshaphat was a good king, following the ways of his father, Asa. He did what was pleasing in the Lord's sight. During his reign, however, he failed to remove all the pagan shrines, and the people never fully committed themselves to follow the God of their ancestors. The rest of the events of Jehoshaphat's reign, from beginning to end, are recorded in the record of Jehu son of Hanani, which is included in the Book of the Kings of Israel. Some time later King Jehoshaphat of Judah made an alliance with King Ahaziah of Israel, who was very wicked. Together they built a fleet of trading ships at the port of Ezianjeber. Then Eliezer son of Dodavahu from Mershah prophesied against Jehoshaphat. He said, Because you have allied yourself with King Ahaziah, the Lord will destroy your work. So the ships met with disaster and never put out to sea. When Jehoshaphat died, he was buried with his ancestors in the city of David. Then his son Jehoram became the next king. Jehoram's brothers, the other sons of Jehoshaphat, were Azariah, Jehiel, Zechariah, Azariahu, Michael, and Shephatiah, all these were the sons of Jehoshaphat king of Judah. Their father had given each of them valuable gifts of silver, gold, and costly items, and also some of Judah's fortified towns. However, he designated Jehoram as the next king because he was the oldest. But when Jehoram had become solidly established as king, he killed all his brothers and some of the other leaders of Judah. Jehoram was thirty-two years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem eight years. But Jehoram followed the example of the kings of Israel and was as wicked as King Ahab, for he had married one of Ahab's daughters. So Jehoram did what was evil in the Lord's sight. But the Lord did not want to destroy David's dynasty, for he had made a covenant with David and promised that his descendants would continue to rule, shining like a lamp forever. During Jehoram's reign, the Edomites revolted against Judah and crowned their own king. So Jehoram went out with his full army and all his chariots. The Edomites surrounded him and his chariot commanders, but he went out at night and attacked them under cover of darkness. 
Even so, Edom has been independent from Judah to this day. The town of Libna also revolted about that same time. All this happened because Jehoram had abandoned the Lord, the God of his ancestors. He had built pagan shrines in the hill country of Judah and had led the people of Jerusalem and Judah to give themselves to pagan gods and to go astray. Then Elijah the prophet wrote Jehoram this letter, This is what the Lord, the God of your ancestor David, says, You have not followed the good example of your father, Jehoshaphat, or your grandfather King Asa of Judah. Instead, you have been as evil as the kings of Israel. You have led the people of Jerusalem and Judah to worship idols, just as King Ahab did in Israel. And you have even killed your own brothers, men who were better than you. So now the Lord is about to strike you, your people, your children, your wives, and all that is yours with a heavy blow. You yourself will suffer with a severe intestinal disease that will get worse each day until your bowels come out. Then the Lord stirred up the Philistines and the Arabs, who lived near the Ethiopians, to attack Jehoram. They marched against Judah, broke down its defenses, and carried away everything of value in the royal palace, including the king's sons and his wives. Only his youngest son, Ahaziah, was spared. After all this, the Lord struck Jehoram with an incurable intestinal disease. The disease grew worse and worse, and at the end of two years it caused his bowels to come out, and he died in agony. His people did not build a great funeral fire to honor him as they had done for his ancestors. Jehoram was thirty-two years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem eight years. No one was sorry when he died. They buried him in the city of David, but not in the royal cemetery. Then the people of Jerusalem made Ahaziah, Jehoram's youngest son, their next king, since the marauding bands who came with the Arabs had killed all the older sons. So Ahaziah son of Jehoram reigned as king of Judah. Ahaziah was twenty-two years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem one year. His mother was Athaliah, a granddaughter of King Omri. Ahaziah also followed the evil example of King Ahab's family, for his mother encouraged him in doing wrong. He did what was evil in the Lord's sight, just as Ahab's family had done. They even became his advisors after the death of his father, and they led him to ruin. Following their evil advice, Ahaziah joined Joram, the son of King Ahab of Israel, in his war against King Haziel of Aram at Ramoth-Gilead. When the Arameans wounded Joram in the battle, he returned to Jezreel to recover from the wounds he had received at Ramoth. Because Joram was wounded, King Ahaziah of Judah went to Jezreel to visit him. But God had decided that this visit would be Ahaziah's downfall. While he was there, Ahaziah went out with Joram to meet Jehu grandson of Nimshi, whom the Lord had appointed to destroy the dynasty of Ahab. While Jehu was executing judgment against the family of Ahab, he happened to meet some of Judah's officials and Ahaziah's relatives who were traveling with Ahaziah. So Jehu killed them all. Then Jehu's men searched for Ahaziah, and they found him hiding in the city of Samaria. They brought him to Jehu, who killed him. Ahaziah was given a decent burial because the people said, he was the grandson of Jehoshaphat, a man who sought the Lord with all his heart. But none of the surviving members of Ahaziah's family was capable of ruling the kingdom. When Athaliah, the mother of King Ahaziah of Judah, learned that her son was dead, she began to destroy the rest of Judah's royal family. But Ahaziah's sister Jehoshaphat, 
the daughter of King Jehoram, took Ahaziah's infant son, Josh, and stole him away from among the rest of the king's children, who were about to be killed. She put Josh and his nurse in a bedroom. In this way, Jehoshaba, wife of Jehoiada the priest and sister of Ahaziah, hid the child so that Athaliah could not murder him. Josh remained hidden in the temple of God for six years while Athaliah ruled over the land. In the seventh year of Athaliah's reign, Jehoiada the priest decided to act. He summoned his courage and made a pact with five army commanders, Azariah son of Jeraham, Ishmael son of Jehohanan, Azariah son of Obed, Messiah son of Adaiah, and Elishaphat son of Zikri. These men traveled secretly throughout Judah and summoned the Levites and clan leaders in all the towns to come to Jerusalem. They all gathered at the Temple of God, where they made a solemn pact with Josh, the young king, Jehoiada said to them, Here is the king's son. The time has come for him to reign. The Lord has promised that a descendant of David will be our king. This is what you must do. When you priests and Levites come on duty on the Sabbath, a third of you will serve as gatekeepers. Another third will go over to the royal palace, and the final third will be at the foundation gate. Everyone else should stay in the courtyards of the Lord's temple. Remember, only the priests and Levites on duty may enter the temple of the Lord, for they are set apart as holy. The rest of the people must obey the Lord's instructions and stay outside. You Levites, form a bodyguard around the king and keep your weapons in hand. Kill anyone who tries to enter the temple. Stay with the king wherever he goes. So the Levites and all the people of Judah did everything as Jehoiada the priest ordered. The commanders took charge of the men reporting for duty that Sabbath, as well as those who were going off duty. Jehoiada the priest did not let anyone go home after their shift ended. Then Jehoiada supplied the commanders with the spears and the large and small shields that had once belonged to King David and were stored in the temple of God. He stationed all the people around the king, with their weapons ready. They formed a line from the south side of the temple around to the north side and all around the altar. Then Jehoiada and his sons brought out Josh, the king's son, placed the crown on his head, and presented him with a copy of God's laws. They anointed him and proclaimed him king, and everyone shouted, Long live the king! When Athaliah heard the noise of the people running and the shouts of praise to the king, she hurried to the Lord's temple to see what was happening. When she arrived, she saw the newly crowned king standing in his place of authority by the pillar at the temple entrance. The commanders and trumpeters were surrounding him, and people from all over the land were rejoicing and blowing trumpets. Singers with musical instruments were leading the people in a great celebration. When Athaliah saw all this, she tore her clothes in despair and shouted, Treason! Treason! Then Jehoiada the priest ordered the commanders who were in charge of the troops, take her to the soldiers in front of the temple, and kill anyone who tries to rescue her. For the priest had said, she must not be killed in the temple of the Lord. So they seized her and led her out to the entrance of the horse gate on the palace grounds, and they killed her there. Then Jehoiada made a covenant between himself and the king and the people that they would be the Lord's people. And all the people went over to the temple of Baal and tore it down. They demolished the altars and smashed the idols, and they killed Mutton the priest of Baal in front of the altars. Jehoiada now put the priests and Levites in charge of the temple of the Lord, following all the directions given by David. He also commanded them to present burnt offerings to the Lord, as prescribed by the law of Moses, and to sing and rejoice as David had instructed. He also stationed gatekeepers at the gates of the Lord's temple to keep out those who for any reason were ceremonially unclean. 
Then the commanders, nobles, rulers, and all the people of the land escorted the king from the temple of the Lord. They went through the upper gate and into the palace, and they seated the king on the royal throne. So all the people of the land rejoiced, and the city was peaceful because Athaliah had been killed. Josh was seven years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem forty years. His mother was Zibiah from Beersheba. Josh did what was pleasing in the Lord's sight throughout the lifetime of Jehoiada the priest. Jehoiada chose two wives for Josh, and he had sons and daughters. At one point Josh decided to repair and restore the temple of the Lord. He summoned the priests and Levites and gave them these instructions, Go to all the towns of Judah and collect the required annual offerings, so that we can repair the temple of your God. Do not delay. But the Levites did not act immediately. So the king called for Jehoiada the high priest and asked him, Why haven't you demanded that the Levites go out and collect the temple taxes from the towns of Judah and from Jerusalem? Moses, the servant of the Lord, levied this tax on the community of Israel in order to maintain the tabernacle of the covenant. Over the years the followers of wicked Athaliah had broken into the temple of God, and they had used all the dedicated things from the temple of the Lord to worship the images of Baal. So now the king ordered a chest to be made and set outside the gate leading to the temple of the Lord. Then a proclamation was sent throughout Judah and Jerusalem, telling the people to bring to the Lord the tax that Moses, the servant of God, had required of the Israelites in the wilderness. This pleased all the leaders and the people, and they gladly brought their money and filled the chest with it. Whenever the chest became full, the Levites would carry it to the king's officials. Then the court secretary and an officer of the high priest would come and empty the chest and take it back to the temple again. This went on day after day, and a large amount of money was collected. The king in Jehoiada gave the money to the construction supervisors, who hired masons and carpenters to restore the temple of the Lord. They also hired metalworkers, who made articles of iron and bronze for the Lord's temple. The men in charge of the renovation worked hard and made steady progress. They restored the temple of God according to its original design and strengthened it. When all the repairs were finished, they brought the remaining money to the king and Jehoiada. It was used to make various articles for the temple of the Lord, articles for worship services and for burnt offerings, including ladles and other articles made of gold and silver. And the burnt offerings were sacrificed continually in the temple of the Lord during the lifetime of Jehoiada the priest. Jehoiada lived to a very old age, finally dying at 130. He was buried among the kings in the city of David, because he had done so much good in Israel for God and his temple. But after Jehoiada's death, the leaders of Judah came and bowed before King Josh and persuaded him to listen to their advice. They decided to abandon the temple of the Lord, the God of their ancestors, and they worshipped Asherah poles and idols instead. Because of this sin, divine anger fell on Judah and Jerusalem. Yet the Lord sent prophets to bring them back to him. The prophets warned them, but still the people would not listen. Then the Spirit of God came upon Zechariah son of Jehoiada the priest. He stood before the people and said, This is what God says, Why do you disobey the Lord's commands and keep yourselves from prospering? You have abandoned the Lord, and now he has abandoned you. Then the leaders plotted to kill Zechariah, and King Josh ordered that they stone him to death in the courtyard of the Lord's temple. That was how King Josh repaid Jehoiada for his loyalty, by killing his son. Zechariah's last words as he died were, May the Lord see what they are doing and avenge my death. In the spring of the year the Aramean army marched against Josh. 
They invaded Judah and Jerusalem and killed all the leaders of the nation. Then they sent all the plunder back to their king in Damascus. Although the Arameans attacked with only a small army, the Lord helped them conquer the much larger army of Judah. The people of Judah had abandoned the Lord, the God of their ancestors, so judgment was carried out against Josh. The Arameans withdrew, leaving Josh severely wounded. But his own officials plotted to kill him for murdering the son of Jehoiada the priest. They assassinated him as he lay in bed. Then he was buried in the city of David, but not in the royal cemetery. The assassins were Josachar, the son of an Ammonite woman named Shimeth, and Jehozabad, the son of a Moabite woman named Shomer. The account of the sons of Josh, the prophecies about him, and the record of his restoration of the Temple of God are written in the commentary on the Book of the Kings. His son Amaziah became the next king. Amaziah was 25 years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem 29 years. His mother was Jehodan from Jerusalem. Amaziah did what was pleasing in the Lord's sight, but not wholeheartedly. When Amaziah was well established as king, he executed the officials who had assassinated his father. However, he did not kill the children of the assassins, for he obeyed the command of the Lord as written by Moses in the book of the law, parents must not be put to death for the sins of their children, nor children for the sins of their parents. Those deserving to die must be put to death for their own crimes. Then Amaziah organized the army, assigning generals and captains for all Judah and Benjamin. He took a census and found that he had an army of 300,000 select troops, 20 years old and older, all trained in the use of spear and shield. He also paid about 7,500 pounds d, of silver to hire 100,000 experienced fighting men from Israel. But a man of God came to him and said, Your Majesty, do not hire troops from Israel, for the Lord is not with Israel. He will not help those people of Ephraim. If you let them go with your troops into battle, you will be defeated by the enemy no matter how well you fight. God will overthrow you, for he has the power to help you or to trip you up. Amaziah asked the man of God, but what about all that silver I paid to hire the army of Israel? The man of God replied, The Lord is able to give you much more than this. So Amaziah discharged the hired troops and sent them back to Ephraim. This made them very angry with Judah, and they returned home in a great rage. Then Amaziah summoned his courage and led his army to the Valley of Salt, where they killed 10,000 Edomite troops from Seir. They captured another 10,000 and took them to the top of a cliff and threw them off, dashing them to pieces on the rocks below. Meanwhile, the hired troops that Amaziah had sent home raided several of the towns of Judah between Samaria and Beth Horon. They killed 3,000 people and carried off great quantities of plunder. When King Amaziah returned from slaughtering the Edomites, he brought with him idols taken from the people of Seir. He set them up as his own gods, bowed down in front of them, and offered sacrifices to them. This made the Lord very angry, and he sent a prophet to ask, Why do you turn to gods who could not even save their own people from you? But the king interrupted him and said, Since when have I made you the king's counselor? Be quiet now before I have you killed. So the prophet stopped with this warning, I know that God has determined to destroy you because you have done this and have refused to accept my counsel. After consulting with his advisors, King Amaziah of Judah sent this challenge to Israel's King Jehosh, the son of Jehoahaz and grandson of Jehu, come and meet me in battle. But King Jehosh of Israel replied to King Amaziah of Judah with this story. Out in the Lebanon mountains, a thistle sent a message to a mighty cedar tree, Give your daughter in marriage to my son. 
But just then a wild animal of Lebanon came by and stepped on the thistle, crushing it. You are saying, I have defeated Edom, and you are very proud of it. But my advice is to stay at home. Why stir up trouble that will only bring disaster on you and the people of Judah? But Amaziah refused to listen, for God was determined to destroy him for turning to the gods of Edom. So King Jehosh of Israel mobilized his army against King Amaziah of Judah. The two armies drew up their battle lines at Beth Shemesh in Judah. Judah was routed by the army of Israel, and its army scattered and fled for home. King Jehosh of Israel captured Judah's king, Amaziah son of Josh and grandson of Ahaziah, at Beth Shemesh. Then he brought him to Jerusalem, where he demolished 600 feet of Jerusalem's wall, from the Ephraim gate to the corner gate. He carried off all the gold and silver and all the articles from the temple of God that had been in the care of Obed-Edom. He also seized the treasures of the royal palace, along with hostages, and then returned to Samaria. King Amaziah of Judah lived for fifteen years after the death of King Jehosh of Israel. The rest of the events in Amaziah's reign, from beginning to end, are recorded in the book of the kings of Judah and Israel. After Amaziah turned away from the Lord, there was a conspiracy against his life in Jerusalem, and he fled to Lachish. But his enemies sent assassins after him, and they killed him there. They brought his body back on a horse, and he was buried with his ancestors in the city of David. All the people of Judah had crowned Amaziah's sixteen-year-old son, Isaiah, as king in place of his father. After his father's death, Isaiah rebuilt the town of Elath and restored it to Judah. Isaiah was sixteen years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem fifty-two years. His mother was Jechaliah from Jerusalem. He did what was pleasing in the Lord's sight, just as his father, Amaziah, had done. Isaiah sought God during the days of Zechariah, who taught him to fear God. And as long as the king sought guidance from the Lord, God gave him success. Isaiah declared war on the Philistines and broke down the walls of Gath, Jabna, and Ashdod. Then he built new towns in the Ashdod area and in other parts of Philistia. God helped him in his wars against the Philistines, his battles with the Arabs of Gur, and his wars with the Munites. Eight the Munites paid annual tribute to him, and his fame spread even to Egypt, for he had become very powerful. Isaiah built fortified towers in Jerusalem at the corner gate, at the valley gate, and at the angle in the wall. He also constructed forts in the wilderness and dug many water cisterns, because he kept great herds of livestock in the foothills of Judah and on the plains. He was also a man who loved the soil. He had many workers who cared for his farms and vineyards, both on the hillsides and in the fertile valleys. Isaiah had an army of well-trained warriors, ready to march into battle, unit by unit. This army had been mustered and organized by Geo, the secretary of the army, and his assistant, Messiah. They were under the direction of Hananiah, one of the king's officials. These regiments of mighty warriors were commanded by 2,600 clan leaders. The army consisted of 307,500 men, all elite troops. They were prepared to assist the king against any enemy. Isaiah provided the entire army with shields, spears, helmets, coats of mail, bows, and sling stones. And he built structures on the walls of Jerusalem, designed by experts to protect those who shot arrows and hurled large stones from the towers and the corners of the wall. His fame spread far and wide, for the Lord gave him marvelous help, and he became very powerful. But when he had become powerful, he also became proud, which led to his downfall. 
He sinned against the Lord his God by entering the sanctuary of the Lord's temple and personally burning incense on the incense altar. Azariah the high priest went in after him with eighty other priests of the Lord, all brave men. They confronted King Isaiah and said, It is not for you, Isaiah, to burn incense to the Lord. That is the work of the priests alone, the descendants of Aaron who are set apart for this work. Get out of the sanctuary, for you have sinned. The Lord God will not honor you for this. Isaiah, who was holding an incense burner, became furious. But as he was standing there raging at the priests before the incense altar in the Lord's temple, leprosy suddenly broke out on his forehead. When Azariah the high priest and all the other priests saw the leprosy, they rushed him out. And the king himself was eager to get out because the Lord had struck him. So King Isaiah had leprosy until the day he died. He lived in isolation in a separate house, for he was excluded from the temple of the Lord. His son Jotham was put in charge of the royal palace, and he governed the people of the land. The rest of the events of Isaiah's reign, from beginning to end, are recorded by the prophet Isaiah son of Amos. When Isaiah died, he was buried with his ancestors, his grave was in a nearby burial field belonging to the kings, for the people said, he had leprosy. And his son Jotham became the next king. Jotham was twenty-five years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem sixteen years. His mother was Jerusha, the daughter of Zadok. Jotham did what was pleasing in the Lord's sight. He did everything his father, Isaiah, had done, except that Jotham did not sin by entering the temple of the Lord. But the people continued in their corrupt ways. Jotham rebuilt the upper gate of the temple of the Lord. He also did extensive rebuilding on the wall at the hill of Awful. He built towns in the hill country of Judah and constructed fortresses and towers in the wooded areas. Jotham went to war against the Ammonites and conquered them. Over the next three years he received from them an annual tribute of 7,500 pounds of silver, 50,000 bushels of wheat, and 50,000 bushels of barley. King Jotham became powerful because he was careful to live in obedience to the Lord his God. The rest of the events of Jotham's reign, including all his wars and other activities, are recorded in the Book of the Kings of Israel and Judah. He was twenty-five years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem sixteen years. When Jotham died, he was buried in the city of David. And his son Ahaz became the next king. Ahaz was twenty years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem sixteen years. He did not do what was pleasing in the sight of the Lord, as his ancestor David had done. Instead, he followed the example of the kings of Israel. He cast metal images for the worship of Baal. He offered sacrifices in the valley of Ben Hinnom, even sacrificing his own sons in the fire. In this way, he followed the detestable practices of the pagan nations the Lord had driven from the land ahead of the Israelites. He offered sacrifices and burned incense at the pagan shrines and on the hills and under every green tree. Because of all this, the Lord his God allowed the king of Aram to defeat Ahaz and to exile large numbers of his people to Damascus. The armies of the king of Israel also defeated Ahaz and inflicted many casualties on his army. In a single day Pekah son of Remaliah, Israel's king, killed 120,000 of Judah's troops, all of them experienced warriors, because they had abandoned the Lord, the God of their ancestors. Then Zikri, a warrior from Ephraim, killed Messiah, the king's son, Azrakam, the king's palace commander, and Elkanah, the king's second-in-command. 
The armies of Israel captured 200,000 women and children from Judah and seized tremendous amounts of plunder, which they took back to Samaria. But a prophet of the Lord named Oded was there in Samaria when the army of Israel returned home. He went out to meet them and said, The Lord, the God of your ancestors, was angry with Judah and let you defeat them. But you have gone too far, killing them without mercy, and all heaven is disturbed. And now you are planning to make slaves of these people from Judah and Jerusalem. What about your own sins against the Lord your God? Listen to me and return these prisoners you have taken, for they are your own relatives. Watch out, because now the Lord's fierce anger has been turned against you. Then some of the leaders of Israel, Azariah son of Jehohanan, Berechiah son of Meshillamoth, Jehizkiah son of Shalom, and Amasa son of Hadlai, agreed with this and confronted the men returning from battle. You must not bring the prisoners here, they declared. We cannot afford to add to our sins and guilt. Our guilt is already great, and the Lord's fierce anger is already turned against Israel. So the warriors released the prisoners and handed over the plunder in the sight of the leaders and all the people. Then the four men just mentioned by name came forward and distributed clothes from the plunder to the prisoners who were naked. They provided clothing and sandals to wear, gave them enough food and drink, and dressed their wounds with olive oil. They put those who were weak on donkeys and took all the prisoners back to their own people in Jericho, the city of Palms. Then they returned to Samaria. At that time King Ahaz of Judah asked the king of Assyria for help. The armies of Edom had again invaded Judah and taken captives. And the Philistines had raided towns located in the foothills of Judah and in the Negev of Judah. They had already captured and occupied Beth Shemesh, Ijalan, Gedaroth, Soko with its villages, Timnah with its villages, and Gimzo with its villages. The Lord was humbling Judah because of King Ahaz of Judah, for he had encouraged his people to sin and had been utterly unfaithful to the Lord. So when King Tiglath-Pileser of Assyria arrived, he attacked Ahaz instead of helping him. Ahaz took valuable items from the Lord's temple, the royal palace, and from the homes of his officials and gave them to the king of Assyria as tribute. But this did not help him. Even during this time of trouble, King Ahaz continued to reject the Lord. He offered sacrifices to the gods of Damascus who had defeated him, for he said, Since these gods help the kings of Aram, they will help me, too, if I sacrifice to them. But instead, they led to his ruin and the ruin of all Judah. The king took the various articles from the temple of God and broke them into pieces. He shut the doors of the Lord's temple so that no one could worship there, and he set up altars to pagan gods in every corner of Jerusalem. He made pagan shrines in all the towns of Judah for offering sacrifices to other gods. In this way, he aroused the anger of the Lord, the God of his ancestors. The rest of the events of Ahaz's reign and everything he did, from beginning to end, are recorded in the book of the kings of Judah and Israel. When Ahaz died, he was buried in Jerusalem but not in the royal cemetery of the kings of Judah. Then his son Hezekiah became the next king. Hezekiah was 25 years old when he became the king of Judah, and he reigned in Jerusalem 29 years. His mother was Abijah, the daughter of Zechariah. He did what was pleasing in the Lord's sight, just as his ancestor David had done. In the very first month of the first year of his reign, Hezekiah reopened the doors of the temple of the Lord and repaired them. He summoned the priests and Levites to meet him at the courtyard east of the temple. He said to them, Listen to me, you Levites. Purify yourselves, and purify the temple of the Lord, the God of your ancestors. 
Remove all the defiled things from the sanctuary. Our ancestors were unfaithful and did what was evil in the sight of the Lord our God. They abandoned the Lord and His dwelling place, they turned their backs on Him. 7. They also shut the doors to the temple's entry room, and they snuffed out the lamps. They stopped burning incense and presenting burnt offerings at the sanctuary of the God of Israel. That is why the Lord's anger has fallen upon Judah and Jerusalem. He has made them an object of dread, horror, and ridicule, as you can see with your own eyes. Because of this, our fathers have been killed in battle, and our sons and daughters and wives have been captured. But now I will make a covenant with the Lord, the God of Israel, so that his fierce anger will turn away from us. My sons, do not neglect your duties any longer. The Lord has chosen you to stand in His presence, to minister to Him, and to lead the people in worship and present offerings to Him. Then these Levites got right to work, from the clan of Kohath, Mahath son of Amasai and Joel son of Azariah. From the clan of Merari, Kish son of Abdi and Azariah son of Jehalalel. From the clan of Gershon, Joah son of Zimah and Eden son of Joah. From the family of Elizaphan, Shimri and Jeel. From the family of Azaph, Zechariah and Metania. From the family of Heman, Jehiel and Shimi. From the family of Jeduthun, Shemaiah and Uzziel. These men called together their fellow Levites, and they all purified themselves. Then they began to cleanse the temple of the Lord, just as the king had commanded. They were careful to follow all the Lord's instructions in their work. The priests went into the sanctuary of the temple of the Lord to cleanse it, and they took out to the temple courtyard all the defiled things they found. From there the Levites carted it all out to the Kidron Valley. They began the work in early spring, on the first day of the new year, and in eight days they had reached the entry room of the Lord's temple. Then they purified the temple of the Lord itself, which took another eight days. So the entire task was completed in sixteen days. Then the Levites went to King Hezekiah and gave him this report, We have cleansed the entire temple of the Lord, the altar of burnt offering with all its utensils, and the table of the bread of the presence with all its utensils. We have also recovered all the items discarded by King Ahaz when he was unfaithful and closed the temple. They are now in front of the altar of the Lord, purified and ready for use. Early the next morning King Hezekiah gathered the city officials and went to the temple of the Lord. They brought seven bulls, seven rams, and seven male lambs as a burnt offering, together with seven male goats as a sin offering for the kingdom for the temple, and for Judah. The king commanded the priests, who were descendants of Aaron, to sacrifice the animals on the altar of the Lord. So they killed the bulls, and the priests took the blood and sprinkled it on the altar. Next they killed the rams and sprinkled their blood on the altar. And finally, they did the same with the male lambs. The male goats for the sin offering were then brought before the king and the assembly of people, who laid their hands on them. The priests then killed the goats as a sin offering and sprinkled their blood on the altar to make atonement for the sins of all Israel. The king had specifically commanded that this burnt offering and sin offering should be made for all Israel. King Hezekiah then stationed the Levites at the temple of the Lord with cymbals, lyres, and harps. He obeyed all the commands that the Lord had given to King David through Gad, the king's seer, and the prophet Nathan. The Levites then took their positions around the temple with the instruments of David, and the priests took their positions with the trumpets. Then Hezekiah ordered that the burnt offering be placed on the altar. As the burnt offering was presented, songs of praise to the Lord were begun, accompanied by the trumpets and other instruments of David, the former king of Israel. The entire assembly worshipped the Lord as the singers sang and the trumpets blew, 
until all the burnt offerings were finished. Then the king and everyone with him bowed down in worship. King Hezekiah and the officials ordered the Levites to praise the Lord with the psalms written by David and by Asaph the seer. So they offered joyous praise and bowed down in worship. Then Hezekiah declared, Now that you have consecrated yourselves to the Lord, bring your sacrifices and thanksgiving offerings to the temple of the Lord. So the people brought their sacrifices and thanksgiving offerings, and all whose hearts were willing brought burnt offerings, too. The people brought to the Lord seventy bulls, one hundred rams, and two hundred male lambs for burnt offerings. They also brought six hundred cattle and three thousand sheep and goats as sacred offerings. But there were too few priests to prepare all the burnt offerings. So their relatives the Levites helped them until the work was finished and more priests had been purified, for the Levites had been more conscientious about purifying themselves than the priests had been. There was an abundance of burnt offerings, along with the usual liquid offerings, and a great deal of fat from the many peace offerings that so the temple of the Lord was restored to service. And Hezekiah and all the people rejoiced because of what God had done for the people, for everything had been accomplished so quickly. King Hezekiah now sent word to all Israel and Judah, and he wrote letters of invitation to the people of Ephraim and Manasseh. He asked everyone to come to the temple of the Lord at Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover of the Lord, the God of Israel. The king, his officials, and all the community of Jerusalem decided to celebrate Passover a month later than usual. They were unable to celebrate it at the prescribed time because not enough priests could be purified by then, and the people had not yet assembled at Jerusalem. This plan for keeping the Passover seemed right to the king and all the people. So they sent a proclamation throughout all Israel, from Beersheba in the south to Dan in the north, inviting everyone to come to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover of the Lord, the God of Israel. The people had not been celebrating it in great numbers as required in the law. At the king's command, runners were sent throughout Israel and Judah. They carried letters that said, O people of Israel, return to the Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, so that he will return to the few of us who have survived the conquest of the Assyrian kings. Do not be like your ancestors and relatives who abandoned the Lord, the God of their ancestors, and became an object of derision, as you yourselves can see. Do not be stubborn, as they were, but submit yourselves to the Lord. Come to his temple, which he has set apart as holy forever. Worship the Lord your God so that his fierce anger will turn away from you. For if you return to the Lord, your relatives and your children will be treated mercifully by their captors, and they will be able to return to this land. For the Lord your God is gracious and merciful. If you return to him, he will not continue to turn his face from you. The runners went from town to town throughout Ephraim and Manasseh and as far as the territory of Zebulun. But most of the people just laughed at the runners and made fun of them. However, some people from Asher, Manasseh, and Zebulun humbled themselves and went to Jerusalem. At the same time, God's hand was on the people in the land of Judah, giving them all one heart to obey the orders of the king and his officials, who were following the word of the Lord. So a huge crowd assembled at Jerusalem in midspring to celebrate the festival of unleavened bread. They set to work and removed the pagan altars from Jerusalem. They took away all the incense altars and threw them into the Kidron Valley. On the fourteenth day of the second month, one month later than usual, the people slaughtered the Passover lamb. This shamed the priests and Levites, so they purified themselves and brought burnt offerings to the temple of the Lord. Then they took their places at the temple as prescribed in the law of Moses, the man of God. The Levites brought the sacrificial blood to the priests, 
who then sprinkled it on the altar. Since many of the people had not purified themselves, the Levites had to slaughter their Passover lamb for them, to set them apart for the Lord. Most of those who came from Ephraim, Manasseh, Issachar, and Zebulun had not purified themselves. But King Hezekiah prayed for them, and they were allowed to eat the Passover meal anyway, even though this was contrary to the requirements of the law. For Hezekiah said, May the Lord, who is good, pardon those who decide to follow the Lord, the God of their ancestors, even though they are not properly cleansed for the ceremony. And the Lord listened to Hezekiah's prayer and healed the people. So the people of Israel who were present in Jerusalem joyously celebrated the festival of unleavened bread for seven days. Each day the Levites and priests sang to the Lord, accompanied by loud instruments. Hezekiah encouraged all the Levites regarding the skill they displayed as they served the Lord. The celebration continued for seven days. Peace offerings were sacrificed, and the people gave thanks to the Lord, the God of their ancestors. The entire assembly then decided to continue the festival another seven days, so they celebrated joyfully for another week. King Hezekiah gave the people 1,000 bulls and 7,000 sheep and goats for offerings, and the officials donated 1,000 bulls and 10,000 sheep and goats. Meanwhile, many more priests purified themselves. The entire assembly of Judah rejoiced, including the priests, the Levites, all who came from the land of Israel, the foreigners who came to the festival, and all those who lived in Judah. There was great joy in the city, for Jerusalem had not seen a celebration like this one since the days of Solomon, King David's son. Then the priests and Levites stood and blessed the people, and God heard their prayer from his holy dwelling in heaven. When the festival ended, the Israelites who attended went to all the towns of Judah, Benjamin, Ephraim, and Manasseh, and they smashed all the sacred pillars, cut down the Asherah poles, and removed the pagan shrines and altars. After this, the Israelites returned to their own towns and homes. Hezekiah then organized the priests and Levites into divisions to offer the burnt offerings and peace offerings, and to worship and give thanks and praise to the Lord at the gates of the temple. The king also made a personal contribution of animals for the daily morning and evening burnt offerings, the weekly Sabbath festivals, the monthly new moon festivals, and the annual festivals as prescribed in the law of the Lord. In addition, he required the people in Jerusalem to bring a portion of their goods to the priests and Levites, so they could devote themselves fully to the law of the Lord. When the people of Israel heard these requirements, they responded generously by bringing the first share of their grain, new wine, olive oil, honey, and all the produce of their fields. They brought a large quantity, a tithe of all they produced. The people who had moved to Judah from Israel, and the people of Judah themselves, brought in the tithes of their cattle, sheep, and goats and a tithe of the things that had been dedicated to the Lord their God, and they piled them up in great heaps. They began piling them up in late spring, and the heaps continued to grow until early autumn. When Hezekiah and his officials came and saw these huge piles, they thanked the Lord and his people Israel. Where did all this come from? Hezekiah asked the priests and Levites. And Azariah the high priest, from the family of Zadok, replied, Since the people began bringing their gifts to the Lord's temple, we have had enough to eat and plenty to spare. The Lord has blessed his people, and all this is left over. Hezekiah ordered that storerooms be prepared in the temple of the Lord. When this was done, the people faithfully brought all the gifts, tithes, and other items dedicated for use in the temple. Konania the Levite was put in charge, assisted by his brother Shimei. The supervisors under them were Jehiel, Azaziah, 
Mahath, Asahel, Jeremoth, Josabad, Eliel, Ismachiah, Mahath, and Benaiah. These appointments were made by King Hezekiah and Azariah, the chief official in the temple of God. Kore son of Imna the Levite, who was the gatekeeper at the east gate, was put in charge of distributing the voluntary offerings given to God, the gifts, and the things that had been dedicated to the Lord. His faithful assistants were Eden, Miniamin, Jeshua, Shemaiah, Amariah, and Shechaniah. They distributed the gifts among the families of priests in their towns by their divisions, dividing the gifts fairly among old and young alike. They distributed the gifts to all males three years old or older, regardless of their place in the genealogical records. The distribution went to all who would come to the Lord's temple to perform their daily duties according to their divisions. They distributed gifts to the priests who were listed by their families in the genealogical records, and to the Levites twenty years old or older who were listed according to their jobs and their divisions. Food allotments were also given to the families of all those listed in the genealogical records, including their little babies, wives, sons, and daughters. For they had all been faithful in purifying themselves. As for the priests, the descendants of Aaron, who were living in the open villages around the towns, men were appointed by name to distribute portions to every male among the priests and to all the Levites listed in the genealogical records. In this way, King Hezekiah handled the distribution throughout all Judah, doing what was pleasing and good in the sight of the Lord his God. In all that he did in the service of the temple of God and in his efforts to follow God's laws and commands, Hezekiah sought his God wholeheartedly. As a result, he was very successful. After Hezekiah had faithfully carried out this work, King Sennacherib of Assyria invaded Judah. He laid siege to the fortified towns, giving orders for his army to break through their walls. When Hezekiah realized that Sennacherib also intended to attack Jerusalem, he consulted with his officials and military advisors, and they decided to stop the flow of the springs outside the city. They organized a huge work crew to stop the flow of the springs, cutting off the brook that ran through the fields. For they said, why should the kings of Assyria come here and find plenty of water? Then Hezekiah worked hard at repairing all the broken sections of the wall, erecting towers, and constructing a second wall outside the first. He also reinforced the supporting terraces in the city of David and manufactured large numbers of weapons and shields. He appointed military officers over the people and assembled them before him in the square at the city gate. Then Hezekiah encouraged them by saying, Be strong and courageous. Don't be afraid or discouraged because of the king of Assyria or his mighty army, for there is a power far greater on our side. He may have a great army, but they are merely men. We have the Lord our God to help us and to fight our battles for us. Hezekiah's words greatly encouraged the people. While King Sennacherib of Assyria was still besieging the town of Lachish, he sent his officers to Jerusalem with this message for Hezekiah and all the people in the city. This is what King Sennacherib of Assyria says. What are you trusting in that makes you think you can survive my siege of Jerusalem? Hezekiah has said, The Lord our God will rescue us from the king of Assyria. Surely Hezekiah is misleading you, sentencing you to death by famine and thirst. Don't you realize that Hezekiah is the very person who destroyed all the Lord's shrines and altars? He commanded Judah and Jerusalem to worship only at the altar at the temple and to offer sacrifices on it alone. 
Surely you must realize what I and the other kings of Assyria before me have done to all the people of the earth. Were any of the gods of those nations able to rescue their people from my power? Which of their gods was able to rescue its people from the destructive power of my predecessors? What makes you think your God can rescue you from me? Don't let Hezekiah deceive you. Don't let him fool you like this. I say it again, no God of any nation or kingdom has ever yet been able to rescue his people from me or my ancestors. How much less will your God rescue you from my power? And Sennacherib's officers further mocked the Lord God and his servant Hezekiah, heaping insult upon insult. The king also sent letters scorning the Lord, the God of Israel. He wrote, Just as the gods of all the other nations failed to rescue their people from my power, so the God of Hezekiah will also fail. The Assyrian officials who brought the letters shouted this in Hebrew to the people gathered on the walls of the city, trying to terrify them so it would be easier to capture the city. These officers talked about the God of Jerusalem as though he were one of the pagan gods, made by human hands. Then King Hezekiah and the prophet Isaiah son of Amoz cried out in prayer to God in heaven. And the Lord sent an angel who destroyed the Assyrian army with all its commanders and officers. So Sennacherib was forced to return home in disgrace to his own land. And when he entered the temple of his god, some of his own sons killed him there with a sword. That is how the Lord rescued Hezekiah and the people of Jerusalem from King Sennacherib of Assyria and from all the others who threatened them. So there was peace throughout the land. From then on King Hezekiah became highly respected among all the surrounding nations, and many gifts for the Lord arrived at Jerusalem, with valuable presents for King Hezekiah too. About that time Hezekiah became deathly ill. He prayed to the Lord, who healed him and gave him a miraculous sign. But Hezekiah did not respond appropriately to the kindness shown him, and he became proud. So the Lord's anger came against him and against Judah and Jerusalem. Then Hezekiah humbled himself and repented of his pride, as did the people of Jerusalem. So the Lord's anger did not fall on them during Hezekiah's lifetime. Hezekiah was very wealthy and highly honored. He built special treasury buildings for his silver, gold, precious stones, and spices, and for his shields and other valuable items. He also constructed many storehouses for his grain, new wine, and olive oil, and he made many stalls for his cattle and pens for his flocks of sheep and goats. He built many towns and acquired vast flocks and herds, for God had given him great wealth. He blocked up the upper spring of Gin and brought the water down through a tunnel to the west side of the city of David. And so he succeeded in everything he did. However, when ambassadors arrived from Babylon to ask about the remarkable events that had taken place in the land, God withdrew from Hezekiah in order to test him and to see what was really in his heart. The rest of the events in Hezekiah's reign and his acts of devotion are recorded in the vision of the prophet Isaiah son of Amoz, which is included in the book of the kings of Judah and Israel. When Hezekiah died, he was buried in the upper area of the royal cemetery, and all Judah and Jerusalem honored him at his death. And his son Manasseh became the next king. Manasseh was twelve years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem fifty-five years. He did what was evil in the Lord's sight, 
following the detestable practices of the pagan nations that the Lord had driven from the land ahead of the Israelites. He rebuilt the pagan shrines his father, Hezekiah, had broken down. He constructed altars for the images of Baal and set up Asherah poles. He also bowed before all the powers of the heavens and worshipped them. He built pagan altars in the temple of the Lord, the place where the Lord had said, My name will remain in Jerusalem forever. He built these altars for all the powers of the heavens in both courtyards of the Lord's temple. Manasseh also sacrificed his own sons in the fire in the valley of Ben-Hinnom. He practiced sorcery, divination, and witchcraft, and he consulted with mediums and psychics. He did much that was evil in the Lord's sight, arousing his anger. Manasseh even took a carved idol he had made and set it up in God's temple, the very place where God had told David and his son Solomon, My name will be honored forever in this temple and in Jerusalem, the city I have chosen from among all the tribes of Israel. If the Israelites will be careful to obey my commands, all the laws, decrees, and regulations given through Moses, I will not send them into exile from this land that I set aside for your ancestors. But Manasseh led the people of Judah and Jerusalem to do even more evil than the pagan nations that the Lord had destroyed when the people of Israel entered the land. The Lord spoke to Manasseh and his people, but they ignored all his warnings. So the Lord sent the commanders of the Assyrian armies, and they took Manasseh prisoner. They put a ring through his nose, bound him in bronze chains, and led him away to Babylon. But while in deep distress, Manasseh sought the Lord his God and sincerely humbled himself before the God of his ancestors. And when he prayed, the Lord listened to him and was moved by his request. So the Lord brought Manasseh back to Jerusalem and to his kingdom. Then Manasseh finally realized that the Lord alone is God. After this Manasseh rebuilt the outer wall of the city of David, from west of the Gion Spring in the Kidron Valley to the Fish Gate, and continuing around the hill of Awful. He built the wall very high. And he stationed his military officers in all of the fortified towns of Judah. Manasseh also removed the foreign gods and the idol from the Lord's temple. He tore down all the altars he had built on the hill where the temple stood and all the altars that were in Jerusalem, and he dumped them outside the city. Then he restored the altar of the Lord and sacrificed peace offerings and thanksgiving offerings on it. He also encouraged the people of Judah to worship the Lord, the God of Israel. However, the people still sacrificed at the pagan shrines, though only to the Lord their God. The rest of the events of Manasseh's reign, his prayer to God, and the words the seers spoke to him in the name of the Lord, the God of Israel, are recorded in the Book of the Kings of Israel. Manasseh's prayer, the account of the way God answered him, and an account of all his sins and unfaithfulness are recorded in the record of the seers. It includes a list of the locations where he built pagan shrines and set up Asherah poles and idols before he humbled himself and repented. When Manasseh died, he was buried in his palace. Then his son Ammon became the next king. Ammon was twenty-two years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem two years. He did what was evil in the Lord's sight, just as his father, Manasseh, had done. He worshipped and sacrificed to all the idols his father had made. But unlike his father, he did not humble himself before the Lord. Instead, Ammon sinned even more. Then Ammon's own officials conspired against him and assassinated him in his palace. But the people of the land killed all those who had conspired against King Ammon, and they made his son Josiah the next king. Josiah was eight years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem thirty-one years. He did what was pleasing in the Lord's sight and followed the example of his ancestor David. 
he did not turn away from doing what was right. During the eighth year of his reign, while he was still young, Josiah began to seek the God of his ancestor David. Then in the twelfth year he began to purify Judah and Jerusalem, destroying all the pagan shrines, the Asherah poles, and the carved idols and cast images. He ordered that the altars of Baal be demolished and that the incense altars which stood above them be broken down. He also made sure that the Asherah poles, the carved idols, and the cast images were smashed and scattered over the graves of those who had sacrificed to them. He burned the bones of the pagan priests on their own altars, and so he purified Judah and Jerusalem. He did the same thing in the towns of Manasseh, Ephraim, and Simeon, even as far as Naphtali, and in the regions all around them. He destroyed the pagan altars and the Asherah poles, and he crushed the idols into dust. He cut down all the incense altars throughout the land of Israel. Finally, he returned to Jerusalem. In the eighteenth year of his reign, after he had purified the land and the temple, Josiah appointed Shaphan son of Azaliah, Messiah the governor of Jerusalem, and Joah son of Johas, the royal historian, to repair the temple of the Lord his God. They gave Hilkiah the high priest the money that had been collected by the Levites who served as gatekeepers at the temple of God. The gifts were brought by people from Manasseh, Ephraim, and from all the remnant of Israel, as well as from all Judah, Benjamin, and the people of Jerusalem. He entrusted the money to the men assigned to supervise the restoration of the Lord's temple. Then they paid the workers who did the repairs and renovation of the temple. They hired carpenters and builders, who purchased finished stone for the walls and timber for the rafters and beams. They restored what earlier kings of Judah had allowed to fall into ruin. The workers served faithfully under the leadership of Jahath and Obadiah, Levites of the Merarite clan, and Zechariah and Meshullam, Levites of the Kohathite clan. Other Levites, all of whom were skilled musicians, were put in charge of the laborers of the various trades. Still others assisted as secretaries, officials, and gatekeepers. While they were bringing out the money collected at the Lord's temple, Hilkiah the priest found the book of the law of the Lord that was written by Moses. Hilkiah said to Shaphan the court secretary, I have found the book of the law in the Lord's temple. Then Hilkiah gave the scroll to Shaphan. Shaphan took the scroll to the king and reported, Your officials are doing everything they were assigned to do. The money that was collected at the temple of the Lord has been turned over to the supervisors and workmen. Shaphan also told the king, Hilkiah the priest has given me a scroll. So Shaphan read it to the king. When the king heard what was written in the law, he tore his clothes in despair. Then he gave these orders to Hilkiah, Ahikam son of Shaphan, Akbar son of Micaiah, Shaphan the court secretary, and Isaiah the king's personal adviser. Go to the temple and speak to the Lord for me and for all the remnant of Israel and Judah. Inquire about the words written in the scroll that has been found. For the Lord's great anger has been poured out on us because our ancestors have not obeyed the word of the Lord. We have not been doing everything this scroll says we must do. So Hilkiah and the other men went to the new quarter of Jerusalem to consult with the prophet Huldah. She was the wife of Shalom son of Tikva, son of Harhaz, the keeper of the temple wardrobe. She said to them, The Lord, the God of Israel, has spoken. Go back and tell the man who sent you. This is what the Lord says, I am going to bring disaster on this city and its people. All the curses written in the scroll that was read to the king of Judah will come true. For my people have abandoned me and offered sacrifices to pagan gods, and I am very angry with them for everything they have done. My anger will be poured out on this place, 
and it will not be quenched. But go to the king of Judah who sent you to seek the Lord and tell him, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says concerning the message you have just heard. You were sorry and humbled yourself before God when you heard his words against this city and its people. You humbled yourself and tore your clothing in despair and wept before me in repentance. And I have indeed heard you, says the Lord. So I will not send the promised disaster until after you have died and been buried in peace. You yourself will not see the disaster I am going to bring on this city and its people. So they took her message back to the king. Then the king summoned all the elders of Judah and Jerusalem. And the king went up to the temple of the Lord with all the people of Judah and Jerusalem, along with the priests and the Levites, all the people from the greatest to the least. There the king read to them the entire book of the covenant that had been found in the Lord's temple. The king took his place of authority beside the pillar and renewed the covenant in the Lord's presence. He pledged to obey the Lord by keeping all his commands, laws, and decrees with all his heart and soul. He promised to obey all the terms of the covenant that were written in the scroll. And he required everyone in Jerusalem and the people of Benjamin to make a similar pledge. The people of Jerusalem did so, renewing their covenant with God, the God of their ancestors. So Josiah removed all detestable idols from the entire land of Israel and required everyone to worship the Lord their God. And throughout the rest of his lifetime, they did not turn away from the Lord, the God of their ancestors. Then Josiah announced that the Passover of the Lord would be celebrated in Jerusalem, and so the Passover lamb was slaughtered on the fourteenth day of the first month. Josiah also assigned the priests to their duties and encouraged them in their work at the temple of the Lord. He issued this order to the Levites, who were to teach all Israel and who had been set apart to serve the Lord, put the holy ark in the temple that was built by Solomon son of David, the king of Israel. You no longer need to carry it back and forth on your shoulders. Now spend your time serving the Lord your God and his people Israel. Report for duty according to the family divisions of your ancestors, following the directions of King David of Israel and the directions of his son Solomon. Then stand in the sanctuary at the place appointed for your family division and help the families assigned to you as they bring their offerings to the temple. Slaughter the Passover lambs, purify yourselves, and prepare to help those who come. Follow all the directions that the Lord gave through Moses. Then Josiah provided 30,000 lambs and young goats for the people's Passover offerings, along with 3,000 cattle, all from the king's own flocks and herds. The king's officials also made willing contributions to the people, priests, and Levites. Hilkiah, Zechariah, and Jehiel, the administrators of God's temple, gave the priests 2,600 lambs and young goats and 300 cattle as Passover offerings. The Levite leaders, Konania and his brothers Shemaiah and Nethanel, as well as Hashabiah, Jeel, and Josabad, gave 5,000 lambs and young goats and 500 cattle to the Levites for their Passover offerings. When everything was ready for the Passover celebration, the priests and the Levites took their places, organized by their divisions, as the king had commanded. The Levites then slaughtered the Passover lambs and presented the blood to the priests, who sprinkled the blood on the altar while the Levites prepared the animals. They divided the burnt offerings among the people by their family groups, so they could offer them to the Lord as prescribed in the Book of Moses. They did the same with the cattle. Then they roasted the Passover lambs as prescribed, and they boiled the holy offerings in pots, kettles, and pans, and brought them out quickly so the people could eat them. Afterward the Levites prepared Passover offerings for themselves and for the priests, the descendants of Aaron, 
because the priests had been busy from morning till night offering the burnt offerings and the fat portions. The Levites took responsibility for all these preparations. The musicians, descendants of Azaph, were in their assigned places, following the commands that had been given by David, Azaph, Heman, and Juduthan, the king's seer. The gatekeepers guarded the gates and did not need to leave their posts of duty, for their Passover offerings were prepared for them by their fellow Levites. The entire ceremony for the Lord's Passover was completed that day. All the burnt offerings were sacrificed on the altar of the Lord, as King Josiah had commanded. All the Israelites present in Jerusalem celebrated Passover and the festival of unleavened bread for seven days. Never since the time of the prophet Samuel had there been such a Passover. None of the kings of Israel had ever kept a Passover as Josiah did, involving all the priests and Levites, all the people of Jerusalem, and people from all over Judah and Israel. This Passover was celebrated in the 18th year of Josiah's reign. After Josiah had finished restoring the temple, King Necho of Egypt led his army up from Egypt to do battle at Carchemish on the Euphrates River, and Josiah and his army marched out to fight him. But King Necho sent messengers to Josiah with this message, What do you want with me, King of Judah? I have no quarrel with you today. I am on my way to fight another nation, and God has told me to hurry. Do not interfere with God, who is with me, or he will destroy you. But Josiah refused to listen to Necho, to whom God had indeed spoken, and he would not turn back. Instead, he disguised himself and led his army into battle on the plain of Megiddo. 23 But the enemy archers hit King Josiah with their arrows and wounded him. He cried out to his men, Take me from the battle, for I am badly wounded. So they lifted Josiah out of his chariot and placed him in another chariot. Then they brought him back to Jerusalem, where he died. He was buried there in the royal cemetery. And all Judah and Jerusalem mourned for him. The prophet Jeremiah composed funeral songs for Josiah, and to this day choirs still sing these sad songs about his death. These songs of sorrow have become a tradition and are recorded in the Book of Laments. The rest of the events of Josiah's reign and his acts of devotion, carried out according to what was written in the Law of the Lord. From beginning to end, all are recorded in the Book of the Kings of Israel and Judah. Then the people of the land took Josiah's son Jehoahaz and made him the next king in Jerusalem. Jehoahaz was twenty-three years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem three months. Then he was deposed by the king of Egypt, who demanded that Judah pay seven thousand five hundred pounds of silver and seventy-five pounds of gold as tribute. The king of Egypt then installed Eliakim, the brother of Jehoahaz, as the next king of Judah and Jerusalem, and he changed Eliakim's name to Jehoiakim. Then Necho took Jehoahaz to Egypt as a prisoner. Jehoiakim was twenty-five years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem eleven years. He did what was evil in the sight of the Lord his God. Then King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon came to Jerusalem and captured it, and he bound Jehoiakim in bronze chains and led him away to Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar also took some of the treasures from the temple of the Lord, and he placed them in his palace in Babylon. The rest of the events in Jehoiakim's reign, including all the evil things he did and everything found against him, are recorded in the book of the kings of Israel and Judah. Then his son Jehoiakim became the next king. Jehoiakim was eighteen years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem three months and ten days. Jehoiakim did what was evil in the Lord's sight. In the spring of the year King Nebuchadnezzar took Jehoiakim to Babylon. Many treasures from the temple of the Lord were also taken to Babylon at that time. 
and Nebuchadnezzar installed Jehoiakim's uncle, Zedekiah, as the next king in Judah and Jerusalem. Zedekiah was 21 years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem 11 years. But Zedekiah did what was evil in the sight of the Lord his God, and he refused to humble himself when the prophet Jeremiah spoke to him directly from the Lord. He also rebelled against King Nebuchadnezzar, even though he had taken an oath of loyalty in God's name. Zedekiah was a hard and stubborn man, refusing to turn to the Lord, the God of Israel. Likewise, all the leaders of the priests and the people became more and more unfaithful. They followed all the pagan practices of the surrounding nations, desecrating the temple of the Lord that had been consecrated in Jerusalem. The Lord, the God of their ancestors, repeatedly sent his prophets to warn them, for he had compassion on his people and his temple. But the people mocked these messengers of God and despised their words. They scoffed at the prophets until the Lord's anger could no longer be restrained and nothing could be done. So the Lord brought the king of Babylon against them. The Babylonians killed Judah's young men, even chasing after them into the temple. They had no pity on the people, killing both young men and young women, the old and the infirm. God handed all of them over to Nebuchadnezzar. The king took home to Babylon all the articles, large and small, used in the temple of God, and the treasures from both the Lord's temple and from the palace of the king and his officials. Then his army burned the temple of God, tore down the walls of Jerusalem, burned all the palaces, and completely destroyed everything of value. The few who survived were taken as exiles to Babylon, and they became servants to the king and his sons until the kingdom of Persia came to power. So the message of the Lord spoken through Jeremiah was fulfilled. The land finally enjoyed its Sabbath rest, lying desolate until the seventy years were fulfilled, just as the prophet had said. In the first year of King Cyrus of Persia, the Lord fulfilled the prophecy he had given through Jeremiah. He stirred the heart of Cyrus to put this proclamation in writing and to send it throughout his kingdom. This is what King Cyrus of Persia says, The Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth. He has appointed me to build him a temple at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Any of you who are his people may go there for this task. And may the Lord your God be with you.